So, you've come to hear me tell a story, have you? If you please, we would love to hear one of your stories. You have seen so much. You have lived so long. At the time of writing, I finished The Longest Journey yesterday, and I'm still sitting here swimming in a flood of thoughts and feelings about it. Not least of which are concerning if it's actually possible to edit some kind of interesting video together out of all my capture, considering I played through a large chunk of the game with the subtitles switched off, and there are just huge sections of footage where nothing happens, while I sit and try to figure out what the hell I'm supposed to do next. I may have to do a few reshoots. Mostly though, the story is absolutely incredible. I mean, this really is top quality writing, the likes of which often feels lost in today's bland modern shooters, soulless formulaic open worlds, cynical live service grinds, and endless nostalgia bait. Because even big producers and publishers can't come up with any better ideas than what we had 20 years ago. Developed by Norwegian studio Funcom, yes, these guys, and with the lead designer Ragnar Thornquist, this guy easily wins the prize for the most awesome name ever. This game and its sequels are games that I should have finished a long time ago. In fact, I've had two or three full starts on this since I bought the special edition of Dreamfall for PC, which also came packaged with the original game. My two favourite genres you see are fantasy, and I'm not talking about Tolkien-esque fantasy of elves and orcs either. I'm talking about Neil Gaiman and Philip Pullman levels of weirdness, with talking animals, bottles that can capture the wind, talking trees, and whatever this is. My other favourite genre is dystopian cyberpunk, the likes of which was first conceived in Gibson's Sprawl trilogy, and one of my all-time favourite books, Snow Crash. And what else do I love? Magic doors. Portal fantasy. Or isekai, as all the kids say these days, because if it's not from Japan, then apparently it just ain't cool. What? So, could you imagine a game where the story is about a hero from a dystopian cyberpunk future who gets sucked through a magic door into a high fantasy world and goes on a chosen one style quest across a magical fairy kingdom with dragons, talking sloths and bird people before returning to her world to blast off into space and fight a chaotic demon cloud to decide the fate of two worlds? Sounds like this was written specifically for me, right? Which is exactly why I finally made myself finish the damn thing after all this time. So, if the story is so amazing, what's the problem? Well, we'll get to that in good time. But for now, let's start positively and meet our hero April and learn a little about her worlds. This is The Longest Journey. So let's be clear here. The Longest Journey is a story first adventure game and it is one hell of a story. So much so that I have no intention or even a desire to talk about it here. This is 100% something you should discover for yourself by playing the game and taking the journey with its protagonist, April Ryan. I am so convinced of this one fact that if you are here for anything other than nostalgia purposes and have not played this game yet, then I'm telling you 100% to close this video and go play the game first. Even though I won't be doing heavy spoilers for the main story arc, I really think this is something best experienced as it was intended first. It's not perfect by any stretch. It has very dated visuals that, while incredibly charming to the likes of me, may be off-putting to others, and it is an old-school point-and-click adventure game, warts and all. But if you can get past all that, then I can assure you right now that The Longest Journey is a journey worth taking. A quick aside concerning playing it though. While this game does run fine on Windows 10, that is to say it doesn't crash, there are some graphical issues, and for that reason and many others, I strongly recommend installing the HD mod available on this site. As well as cleaning and scaling up all this game's textures, it also irons out a lot of issues and glitches the base game has. To be clear, you must install this BEFORE you start your game, as it moves the save game folder and any save games you have from before when it was installed will not work for the HD version. As much as I enjoy playing old school games as they were intended, I can promise you that this one is worth it, and clearly a lot of effort went into bringing it to life. So a huge thank you to everyone who worked on this mod. And with that out of the way, 
why don't we visit a couple of worlds and meet a young lady named April. So, without labouring the point, the longest journey starts, as most great stories of prophesied heroes do, far, far in the past when everything was bigger and better and we all went too far too quickly. So, it's a little cliché, but honestly, The Longest Journey is such a love ladder to so many fantasy novels and comics that I can't really fault it for wearing its inspirations on its sleeves. And this story and world is so jam full of original ideas that I guess having a start like something out of the Silmarillion isn't such a bad thing overall. The very short version of the story states that in the beginning, the logical forces of science and the mystical powers of magic existed in one world. In this united reality, the power to literally make the stars dance was within our grasp, and as usual, humans came along and decided to abuse this power, setting in motion cataclysmic events that would lead to the eventual destruction of everything. At some point in our planet's past, four nomads from the stars known as Drake Kin, or eventually Dragons, came across this world and put their heads together on the dilemma before deciding that the only way to solve this was to divide the One World into two. Out of this, the twin worlds of Stark and Arcadia were born, with Stark being our own world of logical laws, science and technology, and Arcadia being a magical realm of talking fish people and things straight out of the Grimm Brothers' nightmares. Once separated, the forces of magic and science posed no danger to each other, and the balance between them would be observed and regulated by a mortal guardian who would stand between them for a thousand years before handing over his mantle to the next guardian and returning to their body to live out the rest of their lives. Of course, if this process was all fine and dandy, then we wouldn't have much in the way of a game now, would we? And as such, forces have conspired to corrupt this process end the balance, and completely shake up April Ryan's life right around the time when she really needs to get her final paintings done for her senior year exhibition. Our fine arts major, you see, is one of the few people gifted with the power to shift between Stark and Arcadia at will, though she hasn't exactly figured out how to use that power yet. I see you, MCU. I see your blatant plagiarism. As such, it's up to her to take a very long journey across Arcadia gather up a bunch of ancient and difficult to find MacGuffins to open a portal into the realm of the Guardian, and try to put a stop to whatever is causing all this trouble in the first place. So, it's not exactly the most original setup, and I'll talk more on my feelings about Chosen One scenarios in the next video. But it's very gamey. It lays out some clear objectives and sends you on a path to get them, which is nothing more than an excuse for the writer to take you on a tour of the world they've created, and what a couple of worlds they are. So, this is April. April is… well, the girl's a mess. Just look at her room. If our living space is some kind of representation of our psychological state, well, I'm worried for this girl. She's clearly low on income given the size of the box she lives in, and she's not exactly keeping the place clean and tidy either. We learn early on that April is a broke-ass art student, and the sketches strewn around her room confirm not only this, but the frustrating creative block she's dealing with as her final exhibition draws ever closer. Inside her wardrobe, we don't find a lot, and she comments that this was all she could grab when she left, or rather, ran away from home. Which implies all kinds of underlying trauma, to say nothing of the very vivid dream she's been having lately concerning talking trees, dragons, and… well, whatever the fuck this thing is. Our first day with April is really just a tour of her regular life, and a chance to meet the people who are a part of it. She lives in a town called Venice, which is a progressive bohemian area dedicated to culture and art in the city of Newport, which, as we can see, is a massive sci-fi megalopolis that spreads out and up to the heavens, and I wouldn't be surprised to find out it also goes down deep into the Earth's crust either. Here, she attends university as an art student, when we actually get to the university, we can see that April is a mess of insecurities. She's constantly comparing herself to her peers, and clearly she feels inadequate. 
which is compounded by the fact she hasn't been able to paint anything worth a damn in forever. She works part-time as a waitress in some hipster bar alongside this absolute hunk of meat, a dance major named Charlie, a man that she's so convinced is too good for her that she's friend-zoned him in order to avoid any risk of harm to herself. She has an arsehole boss with a heart of gold and a best friend named Emma, who's everything April thinks she's not. Emma wears short skirts and gets all the attention, while April has to deal with this arsehole hitting on her. If I wasn't such a fucking nice guy, I'd smash your fucking face in, bitch. You're gonna be so fucking sorry you ever fucked with me, April fucking Ryan. I will say that I don't think April's relationship with Emma is toxic. In the late game, Emma really comes through for April in a way that only a true friend would. So, why am I talking about any of this? Why aren't we talking about dragons, spaceships, and alchemists that are also world champion hopscotch players? No, really. There's one in the game. Well, because this is damn good character writing, which, aside from some blissfully optional dialogues full of heavy-handed backstory, is all delivered through the course of you taking April through her first day. April seems real to me. I can completely relate to her situation. I was a broke ass student once myself. I've worked dead-end serving jobs, envied my friends who could hook up with a new girl every night while I could barely crawl out from beneath my own insecurities. I've sat in a tiny room with those closest to me and dreamed about what my future might be like. And I have struggled to write two words of an essay until the night before the deadline. I know who this girl is because once upon a time, I was her. I know who you are, boy, because you're me. The main difference here is that at that time in my life, being a long-time reader, I'd have given my right eye and died on the world tree to have fate come knocking at my door and throw a purpose on my lap, especially one with magic doors and fantastical other worlds to contend with. After all, I basically felt rejected by the world I was occupying. At least if I'd had something like that going on, it might have felt like it made a little more sense at the time. Well, as a lover of all kinds of fantasy stories, I like to imagine I'd leap at the chance to be part of one, but I suspect the real prospect of alternate realities rife with magic and danger will be less exciting and more absolutely terrifying. So, that's April. This is our hero. She's not physically strong or gifted in magic, she's not confident and skilled in battle, and she's not all that quick-witted either, but she's very believable and easy to root for. And because this is a very well-written story, I'm sure you can imagine she's going to change in all sorts of ways before it ends. April's journey sees her travelling across the cyberpunk dystopia of Stark and the beautiful and fantastical world of Arcadia. She is tasked with doing incredibly dangerous and absurd things, and to be clear, she is anything but competent about it. Actually, she's downright clueless at the best of times. To demonstrate, at an early point in the game, while on her homeworld of Stark, April needs to track down a runaway kid in a very dangerous part of Venice. And when she does find him, well, she quickly realizes just how unprepared she is for the situation. A nice, pretty girl like you in a neighborhood like this, asking all the wrong questions. You're heading for some serious trouble, you know. I can take care of myself. Mm-hmm. Sure you can. The thing is, there are four guys waiting downstairs for you to come back out, and they can take care of themselves real good. Later in the game, in Arcadia, April is tasked with killing a shark-like creature called a Snapjaw. This is all part of fulfilling some ancient prophecy so that she can be granted special treatment among one of the magical races of Arcadia. At this stage, she's gotten kind of used to this kind of absurdity, and is just trying to push on through to the other side of things. When the dust has settled, however, and she plucks a tooth from the Snapjaw to return with as proof of her victory, well, she suddenly realizes just how much danger she'd been in only a matter of minutes before. This tooth will do just fine. Oh man, that's sharp. I had no idea Snapjaw had razor teeth. If I did, better not think about that now. One of the most memorable moments in the game concerns an alchemist, a flying castle, moving stairways and living statues. You see, an alchemist named Ropa Clax has stolen and sealed up the wind, making it impossible for ships to sail out into the ocean. 
Most people in Arcadia are too afraid to stand against a powerful alchemist for fear of what might happen to them. April, on the other hand, doesn't have the first clue what might happen to a girl who stands against a powerful alchemist, leading her to just march over there, walk through the front door, and talk to him. And this is, in fact, all it takes. Well, there's a calculator as well. There's something to be said for the heroism found in blissful ignorance. In truth, April rarely displays the kind of competence we associate with legendary heroes. She seems to stumble through most of her dramatic encounters versus skillfully beating her enemies with wits or combat prowess. Part of this is definitely down to the story's somewhat satirical leaning. This isn't a balls-to-the-wall comedy like some classic point-and-click adventures such as Simon the Sorcerer, but it's self-aware and not trying to take itself too seriously. Think less Terry Pratchett and more Neil Gaiman. There's also a degree of deus ex machina at work here too. April is a chosen one after all, and in one section, the story's narrator, whom we briefly meet at the start of the game, literally pulls April out of the story she's telling into her house because... Because that's how the story goes, April. At the same time though, there's something very believable about this girl stumbling completely unaware into dangerous situations and somehow escaping out of blind luck and a simple lack of comprehension regarding how much danger she's actually in. April may be a chosen one, but in her mind, she's just trying to fix some problems in her life that she didn't ask to deal with. Not that she's indifferent to the fate of the world. She clearly cares, but given the sharp alteration she's been given to her perspective, she was clearly happier when all she had to worry about was her art exhibition. As such, she's just trying to get to the other side of this as a means to uncomplicate her life. So yeah, the writing is somewhat satirical, but in its own way, it all kind of makes sense. It's only when April returns back to Stark and needs to deal with armed militia and also has to deal with the risk of harm to the people closest to her that we see some of the fear we'd expect to find in a young girl who's in way over her head. So, you may think I'm pretty taken with April at this point. You might even think that I've become romantically attracted to her, and maybe even gone so far as to research the legal process of marrying Code and Pixels. And you'd be right. Yeah, let's transition out of this one. I guess we should talk about Stark first, since that's basically where we start. Admittedly, we see a lot less of this world than we do Arcadia, but what we do see reveals quite the intricate little tale overall. And it's something we uncover layer by layer, starting with the safety and comfort of April's room, and progressing into the cold emptiness of space. In truth, Old Venice, where the game starts, aside from one voice-activated computer, which isn't so uncommon these days, this really could be anywhere in the world of the late 90s and early 2000s. April lives in this cute student boarding house, populated by a diverse cast of young students with their heads full of hope, and run by a lesbian couple, one of whom can't shut up about her sex life. You think so, darling? Yes, I guess we do. And the sex is amazing. Exploring this area, we can see nice parks, cute coffee shops, and even a quaint little hipster art gallery where we get into some deep ruminations on the nature of art. How can a painting have a soul? It has a soul because it has an identity. It has a heart. And then we get to Metro Central in Newport and... My god, did I just wake up in the Matrix or something? Here we see the very quintessential sprawling cyberpunk dystopia. A vast megalopolis stacked and packed on top of itself, with a sky full of flying cars, brutal armed militia patrolling the streets, and a horizon lit up by neon lights like it's Tokyo on any given night of the week. In both Venice and Metro Central, we start to see signs of a somewhat fascist oppression. The militia here does not mess around, and this is something we get a real taste of later in the game too. The police are not a publicly funded government service that exists for the protection of the people and Stark, though some might argue they aren't that now either but rather a privately owned militia who, along with arresting and incarcerating criminals, 
are also required to advertise the products of their parent companies. We're here to protect, serve, and to inform you of the fantastic range of products offered by both Kemba Mercer and Bingo. Moving into the less cared for and seedier areas of the city, we also encounter scenes with something like a film noir vibe, as well as exploring ancient, abandoned industrial warehouses and buildings. It's like this whole area of the city was just forgotten one day, something that I simply can't imagine happening here in Japan with space at such a premium. Later in the game, we are transported into the decadent upper city. This place is largely cut off from the lower city by strict security. Much like the enclaves in Invisible War, there are very specific doors and elevators that separate the haves from the have-nots, showing the extreme to which class divide has now been taken. I mean, it's almost like natural light and clean air are now a privilege of only the wealthy. We only catch a glimpse of this pristine upper world, but the contrast to parts of Lower Newport are literal night and day. Especially when you consider that, much like Midgar in Final Fantasy VII, the lower city is almost in the perpetual shadow of the upper. We only get a brief taste of how the other half live though, and we learn about the outer space colonization process. It seems people are encouraged to volunteer to join the new off-world colonies. They'll be given a home, a job, a new life, and all they ask in return is... Decades of slavery, uh, indentured servitude, to front the costs of getting them there. Wow, that sounds eerily familiar. I still need to play that game. Though Salt Factory's take on it wasn't very flattering. We are introduced to Arcadia for the first time during a dream that April is having at the start of the game. And even in these first pre-rendered backgrounds, we are met with a truly fantastical world of breathtaking alien landscapes, talking trees that take care of eggs, a magnificent white dragon, and a hint of our primary conflict. This really isn't your standard European fantasy world of orcs, elves, and barbarians. Honestly, it's always baffled me that copying one man's interpretation of Scandinavian folklore actually became its own genre, rather than grounds for all kinds of lawsuits. While I do love a good high fantasy adventure, especially if it goes out of its way to subvert a lot of cliches, just ripping off Tolkien and changing all the names, Mr. Gygax, is not only unoriginal, but also completely stifling to a genre that's supposed to be as limitless as someone can imagine. Thank God for writers like these. We make two other significant trips to this magical world. First by stepping through a magical door seemingly created by an old and somewhat mysterious Native American hobo, and at a later time when April is literally sucked in there through her wardrobe. As I said before, this game wears its influences on its sleeves, and I had a blast picking out as many of them as I could possibly find. Again, much like with Stark, Arcadia is revealed to us in layers. Sure, this odd interior we find ourselves in at the start of our first trip there is as far removed from anything we've seen in Newport as possible, but it's nothing to when we finally step out the door and... Man, did I just wake up in the Matrix again? We get to explore Mercuria in both the light of day and at night when it's alive with festivities. And look, I'm gonna spend some time gushing over these pre-rendered backgrounds later, but spoiler alert, man does it get better as the games progress. It seems to draw cultural influences from all over the world, which makes sense as it's a major port city. Moving around we can visit a Persian-style bazaar, a port full of colossal galleons, and later, even ye olde taverns. Oh, and there's also this one house inside a tree? Yeah, actually a thing. Adorable, really. Just beyond the walled borders of the city, we can visit a colossal library built into a mountain, rolling English countryside, dense forests inhabited by things both friendly and terrible, and a floating castle because at this point, why the hell not? It even has a moving staircase puzzle straight out of the Labyrinth movie. But it's the people who make up the place, and the creatures that inhabit this magical world are... Well, they're just magical. April's journey takes her trekking all across Mercuria and a good chunk of the rest of Arcadia. And this land is filled with creatures both abstract and strange. And while we only spend a brief time with each of them, 
we discover a rich and diverse collection of cultures, all living together in a jumbled hodgepodge of a mess that somehow all fits together perfectly. Kind of like a natural ecosystem full of its own conflicts and alliances. While there are numerous magical races within the realm of Arcadia, there are five specific ones that are critical to April's journey, as they each possess one of several MacGuffins that she needs for her quest. These are the Subterranean Banda, the Aquatic Merim and their sworn enemies the Garuda Lycolation, the Time Displaced Venar, and the mysterious book collecting Dark People. We are exposed to considerable slices of their cultures and histories, and this all unfolds quite organically, while April runs about the world trying to piece together all the things necessary to save it from complete annihilation. Probably the two most interesting races we encounter, though not by any means my favourite, are the Merum and the Elation. We encounter the Merum first, when April is left shipwrecked in the middle of the ocean with nowhere to go. And they seem to rescue her. I say seem to because on one hand, they take her to their city deep beneath the ocean, and even impart with her the ability to breathe underwater and communicate with them. On the other hand, they seem to expect that April will now spend the rest of her life within their city, and head out into dangerous waters filled with shark-like snap jaws to basically bring back food for them. And while we don't see any other humans down here, it's implied she's not the only one, and well, isn't that basically slavery? I mean, April isn't exactly imprisoned, but even with her ability to breathe underwater, it's not like she has any idea of where to go, or any hope of swimming under her own power to get to safety. After all, who knows what's down here in the Arcadian Deep. The Elation we meet later, and they are a race of storytellers. Their culture is quite interesting in that while they do share their stories verbally, each Elation tells the story in their own words. In this way, the stories are actually very much alive and free to change and adapt to become relevant to the world in which they are being told. Since these stories are in fact used as part of the Elation's education, it actually makes a lot of sense that each generation should change the stories and maybe even their meanings somewhat, since society and even morality is something that changes over time. After all, a long time ago, public executions of criminals were considered great entertainment in a lot of countries, so I suspect the morality those people held to, and the stories they might tell to each other based on that morality, are quite different to the ones we make now. When you think about it in that way, it really gives the idea of basing your moral compass off some ancient book written by unknown parties some perspective. At the point in time where we meet them, the Merum and the Elation have long been at war. For so long, in fact, that neither really knows how it actually started. Generations have passed, and this is just the way it's always been for the current ones. So, it's quite a big revelation when April discovers that these two species actually share a common ancestor, and once had something of a symbiotic relationship, providing food and protection for each other. We even uncover an ancient village that was once occupied by them. Of course, this all could probably be fixed by their very real and very existing god, the Blue Dragon, that actually sleeps deep beneath the ocean, but he apparently has no interest in helping the people who came to this world with him, or anyone else for that matter. I wish to be left alone. Psh. Gods, am I right, guys? We also meet the mole-like banda, harmless little subterranean creatures that sing to the soil, the dark people whom we learn very little of in this game, but I'll talk more about in the Dreamfall video. Yeah, that's definitely happening. And my favourite little misfit, Abnaxus. We don't get to spend much time with him in this game, but the dude lives in this adorable treehouse. Abnaxus is a Venar, and these creatures experience time as a single moment. Now, ignoring the fact that this may very well be how the universe actually works, and our simple fleshy brains feed this linear progression of causality to us as a way of not blowing up, this is a pretty cool concept for a character. Agnaxus is somewhat talented among his people for being able to bring himself into a single moment, and underwent extensive training so that he could act as an ambassador for his kind. However, his somewhat unique perspective of reality makes him pretty hard to communicate with. I'm sorry, but could you try to be a little less obtuse this time? I have a hard time understanding half of what you say. I will beg for your forgiveness, April Ryan. I had a hard time to make myself understood amongst other peoples. I, will I sort of wonder what kind of language a race like this would have, or if they'd have one at all. Maybe. 
After all, if they know all of their interactions and how it's all going to go, is there anything left for them to talk about? Abnaxus comments that his time among the regular people is very stressful for him, and he expresses a yearning for his home and a return to his natural state. He's quite the charming little creature, and I'm very curious about his people and their way of life. Now, these are just a small sample of the many weird and wonderful creatures we find in Arcadia. We catch a glimpse of the stick people, for example, that are children of the mother tree, and have decided to build a crossbow to launch themselves to the moon. There's the terrifying gribbler and the mysterious drake kin, or dragons that play a significant part in the main story. Everywhere we look in Arcadia, we are met with so much fairy tale wonder and imagination and straight up magic. This is an absolutely fantastic world to explore, and I'm so glad that I finally got around to doing it. Presentation is something that I, oddly enough, feel like I've already done a pretty good job of showing off here. This story and this world is told just as much through what we see on the screen as it is through the somewhat heavy-handed exposition we'll talk about later. Stories of this nature are as much about going on a tour de force of the creator's imaginary world as they are about finding Excalibur and saving the princess. See also any story with a protagonist with amnesia. So I guess we should talk about things from a technical point of view. Graphically speaking, The Longest Journey isn't great. Well, the 3D characters aren't. The backgrounds on the other hand, oh my god the backgrounds. Okay, one thing at a time. Released in 1999 for the PC, this is one year before the PlayStation 2 showed up and graphical potential really exploded. That being said, Grim Fandango released a whole year before this game and was made on a similar budget, and that game really holds up visually even now. This is in part due to its incredibly stylized visuals, which make it almost timeless in that regard. But yeah, you can see here that our characters are very blocky. That's not a problem for me exactly. As an older guy reliving his youth through creating nostalgia YouTube content, this kind of stuff is very charming for me, and no doubt at the time no one was complaining about the way the game looked. Despite working with very clear limitations in polygon count, the various creatures and people in this world all stand out and communicate exactly what needs to be said. I look at this guy and I see a ship captain with a swagger. Here's an old guy who's probably got a few stories to tell. This is terrifying. Here's an evil wizard. Some adorable mole people and mysterious magical beings. This is one of the reasons why I really enjoy revisiting older games. It's just amazing to see what could be accomplished with such a minimal palette in terms of character and creature design. But more so than that, I'm such a huge sucker for pre-rendered backgrounds. Actually, there's this account on Twitter. Yes, I'm on Twitter. Throw me a follow there if you want to see more random musings from me. It's called pre-rendered backgrounds, and that's literally all they post. Two or three times a day, every day, they share a shot of a background from a game and tell you the game it's from. As a lover of retro games and a 3D artist myself, I can't tell you how much this lightens my mood when I see them. It's just as fun seeing locations from games I know as it is ones I don't. There's a hell of a lot of visual storytelling going on here though. None of these scenes were thrown together in any kind of random fashion. They didn't just make a theatre for you to find a character in. They really thought about what an old analog theatre might be like in a modern dystopian sci-fi setting, and did their best to create a mood and atmosphere and tell a story with that scene. They also used pre-rendered cutscenes to handle scenery animation, which is another little thing I love. I probably saw this kind of thing for the first time in either Resident Evil or Final Fantasy VII, but it works just great here too. So yeah, the presentation is showing its age in places, but I think a lot of it still holds up just fine. It may put off younger players from giving it a try, but that's what remakes and remasters are for, right? A man can hope. I know this part was pretty short, but that's because I feel the presentation weaves so well into the story and the mechanics that I feel I've got it adequately covered between those two areas. So let's move on to that last part. So mechanically speaking, The Longest Journey is a point and click adventure game, and that's probably all I need to say on the matter. Seriously, 
If you've played even one other point and click adventure game, then you know exactly how this game plays. In fact, I usually wait until I've finished a game before I do any serious writing about it. But I started writing this part when I was on chapter 4 of 12. I was so certain that I'd got it all figured out that I just went ahead and started putting my thoughts on paper, with a view to make edits later if any big mechanical surprises were forthcoming, and well, they weren't. This is a little concerning actually, because there's quite a few point and click adventure games that I'm a fan of and would like to cover here one day. So I guess I'll be referring back to this section a lot. But hey, gotta keep that channel engagement up, right? So, where to start? Well, being a point and click adventure game is probably this game's biggest strength and weakness. Since this is clearly just a massive interactive book, the removal of anything that could be called a real game mechanic really pushes the story to the forefront. Sorry Diablo, but left clicking a lot doesn't count as a natural game mechanic. These games live or die on the strength of their stories and characters, and that's probably why so many of them were works of comedy genius back in the day. Of course, there were intrigues, mysteries, and plenty of magical worlds to explore, but nothing will endear you to a character faster than making you laugh. Though there is something of a gamble here, as missing with your jokes will transform a character from lovable into outright annoying in a heartbeat. Isn't that right, Nathan? So, this is probably the area where I'll have the most criticism of the game and the genre as a whole. I mentioned at the start that I'd been intrigued by this game since it first came out, and despite several attempts, I just hadn't been able to finish it. And that's because, as much as I do enjoy them, point-and-click adventure games can be a real slog to get through sometimes. So let's start with a big disclaimer here and say that The Longest Journey is 100% a product of its era and genre. The game was clearly never about redefining what adventure games were. It's just doing all the things that adventure games have been doing since Enchanted Scepters came out in 1984, and other genre classics such as Day of the Tentacle and Full Throttle were doing after that. It fits comfortably into a defined category with a clear target audience and tells its unique story to them. And in that regard, it 100% succeeded. The Longest Journey was enough of a commercial success to warrant it getting a sequel greenlit, and has a dedicated fanbase that kickstarted its final installment to a sum of over a million dollars. It's highly regarded among genre fans and retro game enthusiasts in general, and this first one especially is considered by many to still be the best of the three games. So while judged by its own standards, The Longest Journey is just fine. That doesn't mean we can't look at it critically with the knowledge we have about interactive storytelling now, and consider why it might be somewhat dated and even inaccessible to new players today. Adventure games have two very simple mechanics. Lock and key puzzles and conversation trees. A lot of conversation trees. Like so many- Wait, I've done this bit before, haven't I? And since we're talking about conversations here, that means dialogue trees. A lot of dialogue trees. Like so many dialogue trees. There are problems with both of these, at least in the form they take in the original game. The first is that the puzzles are nonsensical, overly complex, and based on completely alien logic. And the second is that the dialogue trees are mostly pointless. I mentioned this in my vampire review, but dialogue trees aren't really any kind of mechanic, and don't really serve any purpose. You know from the outset that you're going to click through every option, and that it's probably going to mean sitting through long exposition-filled information dumps which are easily one of the worst ways a developer can convey information about their story to their player. I'm sorry Mr. Kojima, it's just not cool. Now, in defense of these conversations, they do flesh out the characters, the setting, have lots of witty banter and great voice acting. There is actually a really interesting puzzle when April first arrives in Arcadia based around them. You see, she can't understand anyone there, but Going through the actions of speaking to this character, Vestrum Tobias, she enables the magic of Arcadia's all tongue to enter her, and is then able to communicate with him. While this is a very specific situation, I wonder if there's more uses for this kind of mechanic in a dialogue tree, a way of teasing information out of an NPC with the right cues at the right moment. Even so, these things can be a slog to get through, and I often found myself sighing when I clicked on an NPC and found a long list of topics waiting for me while wondering just how long I'd be sitting through each one before I could move on to the next. So, yeah, I'm a very show-don't-tell kind of guy. 
I love how in games like Half-Life 2 and in the recent Doom games, you're only really exposed to the mission critical parts of the lore, and the rest is left for you to figure out for yourself. Doom 2016 handles this somewhat clumsily through codex entries that you have to take yourself out of the game to go and read, while Half-Life 2 places the information around you in the world for you to find if you're willing to stop, smell the roses, and actually listen to what this arsehole is saying from time to time. I'm not saying that The Longest Journey doesn't have plenty of environmental and implied storytelling. If you're actually watching this video versus having me on in the background while you get on with your life, hopefully you can see just how much more there is to learn about these places hidden all about them. From the bums and the junkies in Metro Central, to the paintings in the Temple of the Balance, to the weird alien scenery of the Merum City, you really are drinking in a good percentage of this story through your eyes. On the other hand though, April can basically ask her friends to explain their entire backstories and the events that led them to meeting and becoming friends if she wants to. These conversations are thankfully optional, though you may not know that in a first playthrough. It's nice that the writers thought all of this stuff up and that they took the time to add it for those who want to know, but honestly, I think it would have been better to leave it out completely and let people make up that part of the story for themselves. That kind of emergent narrative is the real gold of interactive storytelling. That being said, there are some absolutely killer moments in this game, such as April's conversation with her estranged mother. It's made pretty clear at the start of the game that April didn't exactly leave home under the best of circumstances, and at one point in a police station, you have access to a video caller and a chance to call April's parents. I've spent a lot of time praising the great characterization and voice acting in this game, but I think this moment in particular is a real standout for everyone involved. It just really packs a whole punch and tells us so much about our girl and just how messed up she is in a relatively short and well-delivered conversation. So the conversations, while very funny, entertaining and outright tear-jerking at times, are also heavy-handed and long-winded in places. I mean, I think it's cool that someone saw fit to write several parables for the Elations to share with April, but I really didn't want to have to sit through them all. I don't want to put anyone off playing the game by saying this, but be prepared going in. It's worth it, but you may need to play in shorter bursts over a longer period to get through all this. Now the puzzles are also an area where I have a lot of issues, though a lot of those are simply resolved by having access to a smartphone while playing the game, or just tabbing out into a browser when you're done having your time wasted by this thing. I by no means think that you should be following a guide all the way through, but just so you know, when you finally had enough of trying to figure out what you're supposed to do because you missed some tiny little thing hidden somewhere in some obscure part of the scenery, I won't blame you for looking it up in a guide and skipping on through to the next part. As much as I like a challenge, there's such a thing as a bitter victory, and in the end we only have so much time to dedicate to games each day, and it's supposed to be fun. Now, I'm not advocating for hand-holding here. Trust me, nothing about this game would be improved by waypoints or any of the other so-called quality of life improvements of modern games. But I am advocating for things to just be fair. Old school adventure games, to put it simply, are not fair. They are not fair in the same way a magic trick isn't fair. I'm actually a pretty competent card magician myself, and one of the main reasons that magic tricks work is because the spectator doesn't actually know what the outcome is going to be. In fact, the big number two rule of magic, next to the obvious never tell them how it's done, is never repeat a trick, or at least never repeat it in the same way. I mean, imagine just how much more difficult a jigsaw would be if you didn't know what the final picture was, and now imagine that the final picture is completely alien architecture for which you have absolutely no frame of reference. That's what puzzles feel like in a lot of these old games. It's not every puzzle. In fact, there are plenty of simple lock and key situations, or moments where the answer isn't quite so obscure. But there's a very early puzzle involving a clamp and an inflatable duck that you use to fish a screwdriver or something out of some easy to miss location. It's just ridiculous. I mean, mad respect and kudos to anyone who managed to figure it out by themselves back in the day, but I really wouldn't have had that kind of patience. Now there's definitely some fun to be had here, but it starts all mixed up. For example, you're going to be able to pick up things and examine them in April's apartment, long before you have any idea that you need anything to achieve anything else. 
It's pretty fun, for example, examining this little toy of April's and finding all the little pieces that are hidden on it. But you have to ask yourself, why are you doing any of this at all? The issue then is that when a puzzle does present itself, the solution could be in any one of any number of previously visited locations, with something minor that you've overlooked. Just something as simple as finding April's timesheet so she can get paid can be something of a conundrum on your first run. This does become less of an issue later in the game. Of course, when April is on some tropical island in Arcadia, it's safe to assume that the solution to any puzzle there isn't back in the Merrim City or somewhere on Stark, as she has no means to get back to either of those places. Eventually though, this level of abstract thinking leads to you just trying every object on every unlikely lock. And when that fails, trying to combine everything with everything else to see if something sticks. This was actually a regular complaint leveled at these old school adventure games back in the days of glossy video game magazines. So hey, at least we know gaming journalists kind of sucked at the games they played back then too, huh? Since we're on the subject of time wasting, I need to point out this whole skit in the library on Arcadia later in the game. April needs to gain access to information from a specific book, and you basically have to click through the same conversation lines each time with this librarian, so you can select which book you want him to get for you, then suffer through this unskippable animation as he dodders off to collect it, bring it back to you and open it so that you can read it. And given there's several books, and only one of them contains the quest critical information, it can be annoying as hell watching him go through this routine every time. So, yeah. Between the conversations and the puzzles, it really can feel like this game is wasting your time. Which may explain why it took me until now and some external motivation in the form of this YouTube channel to finally get through it. It's not that these things are objectively bad. And it's not like every puzzle is like navigating alien terrain while wearing a blindfold. But it can wear you down after a while. So, yeah, baby steps. And keep your phone to hand. Unless you really get a kick out of puzzles like this, don't make yourself suffer for the sake of enjoying the story. Most of what I've said here is addressed more or less 100% in the sequels, so it's clear I'm not the only one who felt this way, and this kind of feedback made its way back to the developers. Reading back through this, it sounds a lot more negative than I intended, but I do think that it's fair. Don't leave here thinking I had a bad time though. Hopefully all the great stuff I said about this game prior has made it clear that despite its flaws, I really do enjoy it. It's taken me several attempts to get to the end of The Longest Journey, but I can honestly say it was worth it in the end. As a story first kind of gamer, this is definitely a story worth experiencing, and these are absolutely characters worth meeting. It has some problems, at least when gauged by the standards of modern games, but it has by no means aged badly. Take your time with it, and don't be shy about looking up the answers of a few puzzles along the way, and you're going to have a great time with this. Portal fiction is very often the story of a journey back home. Often the protagonist is lost in another world and cut off from their loved ones and family and looking to get back to their status quo. I've always had something of a problem with this. After all, a journey changes a person, and most stories have an element of growing up and becoming a different person in the process, which leaves me wondering if the place they came from is even their home anymore. As someone who lives on the other side of the world to the country he was born in, this is actually a question I've had to put to myself once or twice. And in truth, I don't think I could ever see myself returning back to the life I left behind. I don't even think it's there anymore. I have lots of good memories, and there are people there that I miss, but life has to move forward, and I'm more content and fulfilled here than I ever was. Characters like April, likewise, may have family and friends back in their homes, but by the end of their journeys in the New World, they have friends there too. And after discovering a magical realm like Arcadia, could you really just go back to working 8 till 6 knowing that once upon a time, far, far away, all of creation hinged on your actions? As April leaves the Tower of the Balance, her monumental quest finally complete, we see herself musing on these very thoughts, before she finally vanishes through a shift. I wonder where she'll go from here, and who she shall become. There is a need in large productions such as modern day AAA games to play it safe. 
Investors play a big part in this, as they'd much rather put their money into a project that has all the appropriate buzzwords at the time. For example, I've no doubt there was a period there during the Xbox 360 and PlayStation 3 era where the words cover-based combat did wonders for opening up investor wallets. These are, after all, not people interested in games or artistic integrity. And you've only got to look at the landscape of popular online shooters filled with battle passes and loot boxes, or the absolute abomination that is Diablo Immortal, to confirm that sentence that I just said. When making a sequel, there is also a need to give the audience what it wants, or at the very least what it thinks it wants. Given that The Longest Journey, a PC-only title, shipped over half a million copies, easily making back its two to three million dollar budget, getting the sequel greenlit probably wasn't much of an issue. But what to actually do with that sequel? Now, that's a question. The Longest Journey was a narrative-driven, point-and-click adventure game, and thanks to seven years of time passing and a new console generation changing a lot about how we played games, it wasn't going to be just as simple as giving people more of the same. The point-and-click adventure game had all but faded away, and the keyboard and mouse and the DualShock analog pad was now how things were done. So, things were going to have to change, especially if Funcom was serious about releasing on consoles, which they absolutely were at the time. There are certainly plenty of stories to tell in worlds as wild as Stark and Arcadia, but given our girl April literally thwarted the machinations of dragons, cults, and all kinds of other things to stop the balance from being utterly destroyed, I'd say we're going to be very hard-pressed to find us a Ryan-level threat to deal with. As such, creator Ragnar began pitching ideas for sequels that focused around a new female protagonist who was actually on a quest to find April Ryan, as a way of both bringing new players into the world and hopefully giving returning fans more of what they wanted. It took several iterations to get right, but finally, a pitch that everyone would be happy with was eventually settled on, and production was begun. So, without further preamble, why don't we see how it came out? This is Dreamfall. Before we get started, I'd just like to post a quick warning here that this video will spoil some of the plot points about the Longest Journey game. So if you haven't played that, then I'd advise you to go and do just that before you get started on this video. There will no doubt be some light spoilers for Dreamfall here too, but I'm not going to be taking you on a play-by-play -play of the story as, just like in the first game, I think it's something best uncovered for yourself. We can't, however, really talk about this game without having some idea of who the new and returning players are and what the conflict is. So why don't we go ahead and get on with that. So there were several interesting writing challenges presented when making a sequel to The Longest Journey. First, there is the often common issue in games of escalation. In The Longest Journey, the fate of not one, but two worlds is threatened, and while April Ryan certainly has a lot of developing to do as a person, she'd reached a kind of mastery in her role as a shifter, walking between the two worlds. Certainly, she seemed somewhat lost after fate was finished using her as an instrument, and life on Stark seemed… sketchy. You see, by the end of the first game, April was being hunted by the Church of Voltec, and had also all but sold herself into corporate slavery to get a ticket to an off-world space station and the Syndicate doesn't take kindly to people backing out of those deals. On the other hand though, she had finally, in a way, reconciled her past with her father, and with all her new knowledge, maturity and power, she was staring down a future of infinite possibilities. Something that was clearly very intimidating to her. In Silent Hill and Max Payne 2, the issue of escalation was handled by telling smaller, more introspective stories about characters undergoing significant personal development. Even if Rockstar did just decide to say to hell with all the character development Max went through in the second game and reset him to being upset about his family again. Dreamfall is to some degree a story of the same nature. It's more focused on characters and personal struggles than on world-ending events. Dreamfall and Dreamfall Chapters are actually two parts of one story, and you can rest assured that by the end of this saga, the stakes have soared and even overtaken anything that the first game had to offer. But in this first part at least, things are much more grounded. Well, I'd say about as grounded as a story about travelling between two worlds can get anyway. A big part of this is our new protagonist Zoe, who's just getting introduced to all this and serves as a good jumping on point for new players, 
especially because Dreamfall released on the Xbox and was responsible for introducing the game and the worlds to filthy console peasants. I'm sorry, I meant to say my fellow gaming brethren on the consoles. Zoe's adventure starts when her on and off boyfriend Reza, a reporter writing for an anti-syndicate newspaper, goes missing, and she briefly finds herself caught up in an assassination attempt on a scientist in a lab before falling under the scrutiny of the ever-watchful eye. Much more of Zoe's story takes place on Stark than April's did. We visit several locations on her journey, including revisiting Newport's Venice, and even the old boarding house where April was living, and it's... Yeah, that stung a little. We also travel all the way to Hokkaido and Russia, as we uncover a tangled mystery based around a powerful tech company called Watikor, and their big new interactive entertainment system, the Dream Machine. Another big hook in Zoe's quest is recurring visions of something straight out of a fear game. She's seeing white noise and some kind of twisted house, complete with its own Sadako, who has one command for Zoe. Find her. Save her. Find her. Save her. What was that? And believe me, this one Better? gets dark. Yeah. While the longest journey kept true to much of the light-hearted tone so prevalent in point-and-click adventures, things start to shift here. This is especially true in Arcadia. While the wisecracking crow does make a return in this game, I couldn't help but want to say, man, now really is not the time when he started with his quips in this one. Things have changed a lot in Arcadia. We actually begin our exploration of this place as the one and only April Ryan, and oh boy, has 10 years changed her. Yes! Anyone else getting real T2 vibes out of this? The primary conflict in Arcadia concerns the massive Azadi force now occupying Mercuria, and the scrappy ragtag group of rebels who are fighting back. This is a lot more complicated than it first seems though. So, in The Longest Journey, the primary antagonists on Stark were the Church of Voltec, an organization headed by one of the four Drake kin. In Arcadia, they are known as the Vanguard, and their primary goal is, was, the reunification of Stark and Arcadia, and a return to former glories, which, let's be real, is always a very bad idea, as so-called former glories only exist as a sugar-coated memory of what the world once was. Towards the end of the game, Mercuria is attacked and occupied by an invading force called the Tyral, operating on the Vanguard's behalf. The Azadi actually came and liberated Mercuria from the Tyral. They welcomed its former occupants back, and set up a garrison to protect the city from further attacks until life had returned to normal. And then, they just… didn't leave. The problem here is that the Azadi are deeply religious, incredibly prejudiced against magicals, and very intolerant of faiths that differ from their own. So, during their occupation of Mercuria, the Azadi have outlawed the sentinel religion of the Northlands, enforced their own beliefs in their one goddess, and confined the magical races to a ghetto that is routinely and violently raided by their soldiers. The victims of these raids are taken away and never seen again. They're also building this massive tower, but we'll talk about that in the next video. So April and a large contingent of disgruntled magicals have formed a resistance and are now running a guerrilla war against the Azadi. In retaliation, the Azadi have dispatched an elite warrior known as an Apostle to purify her through rebirth. No need to guess what the initial requirements for that are. We do actually get to control Kian Alvane at several points in this game, but he's a much more important character when we get to chapters. So, those are our primary conflicts. In a way, they're very much more human than what we had in the previous game. Illegal research and dangerous new technology and an occupying army trying to erase an entire culture may not be world-ending, but it's very grounded and far more complex in scope. In the longest journey, April needed only bring the right person to the Tower of Balance that they ascend to become the new Guardian, and the plans of the Vanguard will be thwarted for another thousand years. Here though, it's just not so simple. It's nice to imagine that a scrappy group of rebels could overpower a much greater force by, for example, simply taking out their leader, or maybe blowing up some super weapon. 
but the reality of it would be that the death of a leader would simply lead to the ascension of another. At best, there may be a temporary recall of troops to consolidate strength in the homeland while a new leader was being decided on, but once it was done, you know they'd be back, and in force. Likewise, the megacorps of dystopian sci-fi are beyond reprimand. They are the true power in these worlds, while democratically elected officials are just puppets that put on a facade of democracy so that people think that they have some kind of say in how the world works. This way, the population just buys their new smartphones and don't ask questions about the way the world is really run. Exposing illegal research or shady dealings may cause a minor bump in the road, but nothing is really going to change in the end. So, it's all pretty bleak, and not as gamey this time. There's no MacGuffins to find or prophecies to fulfill either, and what could these two seemingly separate narratives possibly have to do with each other? Well, there's a small hint at the start. You see, in the first game, we encounter a drunk from Stark named Brian Westhouse in Arcadia. He mentions he was displaced in time when crossing from one world to the other by traveling through the Dreaming. And in this prologue, we discover he wasn't 100% forthcoming about that. What? God. What is that? What? So that's our setup. So why don't we meet our new queen on the board and get acquainted with Zoe Castiel? So this is Zoe. This is how we meet her. At the end of her journey. Locked in a coma and yet somehow aware of what's going on around her. And she wants to tell us the story of how she got here. And man, if that isn't one hell of a hook right there, well, I don't know what is. I got a letter. The name on the envelope said Mary. So, while there's plenty of things to say about Zoe in general, I think one way to look at our introduction to her is by contrasting it with what we got when we met April back in the first game. We meet both of them half-dressed in their bedrooms, and maybe this is the first moment where we can start appreciating the game's, ahem, <coughs> higher resolution. So, while this isn't some lavish queen-sized bedroom with a walk-in closet, Zoe's certainly better off than April was. Now sure, the room's a mess, but it doesn't have the underlying sense of desperation that April's little box overlooking murky canal water had. When we met April, she was a nearly broke art student, who had run away from home to put herself through college while staying in the cheapest room she could find, which she funded by pulling shifts as a waitress in a cafe bar, and hanging all her hopes for the future on her big art exhibition that was coming up and no real idea of what she'd do if that didn't work out. Zoe, on the other hand, has a very comfortable existence. She lives in the glorious city of Casablanca in northwest Africa, which clearly has none of the air pollution problems that Newport had, and is positively uplifting even by the standards of the nicest parts of that place. Her home is spacious, and she is cared for by her father, though her mother is noticeably absent. Unlike April, who was determined to make it through college and pursue her dream, Zoe recently dropped out and is now drifting with no real direction in a kind of limbo. She wakes up late, lounges around her house half naked all day while watching the screen in her room. Meanwhile, April had to share a screen in the common room with everyone else in the building she lived in. And while Zoe does a lot of complaining about being bored, she doesn't seem to be doing anything about it. Zoe also has this cute AI robot friend named Wonkers, who's been a kind of surrogate parent and best friend to her since she was very young. And while April had this charming example of the human race hitting on her, Zoe has this real stand-up, on-again, off-again boyfriend named Reza, who's either got the patience of the Buddha and the capacity for forgiveness of the Christ, or is just a massive simp who needs to be told he can do better, because she is messing him around a lot. On the surface, April and Zoe seem like polar opposites. Zoe has everything April didn't, a loving father, a nice home, and free reign to do what she wants. April was abused and escaping a violent household. She was scrappy and driven, yet still hampered by low self-esteem. 
Zoe is just directionless, and more than happy to sponge off her dad and mess around with Reza's feelings rather than actually get her shit together. So, are you thinking I don't like Zoe? Trust me, nothing could be further from the truth. I love this girl. Her coming from a more privileged start than April doesn't mean she doesn't have problems, and I can relate 100% to feeling hopelessly dissatisfied with everything and drifting completely directionless through life, unable to get really motivated or excited about anything. It's called depression. And Zoe may not be there yet, but she is well on her way. If, by chance, you just stopped and asked, what does this privileged little girl have to be depressed about? Well, congratulations on not understanding depression at all. Yes, Zoe has a comfortable existence. Something that can be very hard to break out of, especially when you see just how much regular life takes out of people. But simply existing in comfort is not the same as living or thriving. It's very likely at some earlier point in her life, following in her father's footsteps as a bioneer felt like a real dream. But discovering that wasn't what she wanted completely derailed her life and left her floundering and distrustful of any other desires to achieve something. The girl really needs to take action to break out of this, but with our bodies programmed to embrace comfort and shy away from resistance, well, you can see a kind of vicious circle here, spiraling all the way down to the bottom. Fortunately or unfortunately for Zoe, depending on how you look at it, events conspire to prize her out of her docile life and into one of action, and ultimately leading to her stepping across the divide into the magical realm of Arcadia. While I've accused Zoe of being inconsiderate with Reza's feelings, potential danger leveled at the guy is more than enough to spur her into action, even up to sending her rushing more than halfway around the world, infiltrating dangerous crack houses, tangling with the all-powerful Syndicate Eye, and even infiltrating the headquarters of the powerful Wati Corp. And remember guys, this is dystopian sci-fi here. Corpos are a law unto themselves, so the consequences of getting caught are as severe as they could be. It's not that Zoe is unbelievably brave, and she certainly isn't physically imposing or some kind of action heroine, but she's clearly very determined, and maybe even just a little stupid, which makes her willing to venture into very dangerous places in order to help both her friends and the larger world as she uncovers the sinister plans of Wati Corp. I could say more, but I already feel like I'm tiptoeing around spoilers here. Let's just say I was very satisfied with who Zoe had become by the end of this. In truth, I think all of that was already there inside her, and no doubt had she been motivated to deal with normal things in her life, she'd be a straight-A student and a Taekwondo gold medalist. But that simply isn't her real talent, or where her calling lies. When playing The Longest Journey, I found myself musing on April Ryan and the role of the Chosen One, and how the status of being a prophesied hero all but removes agency from a character who is just being buffeted around by the winds of fate, and also how a Chosen One is often chosen to maintain or even restore a kind of status quo against some monumental change. This being fantasy, showing change as something objectively bad is quite easy, but in reality, Change is just the natural state of the universe. And while great change can be painful, the end of one thing is ultimately the beginning of something new. Embracing this and letting go of what came before can lead to something even greater growing out of the rebirth, while clinging onto something long past its time can lead to it growing stale and rotten. This is where I've actually got to give Dark Souls a little bit of credit. While a chosen undead, or ashen one, may be tasked with restoring lost glory and returning the world to a status quo, it is heavily implied that this is not such a great thing overall, and that letting the fire simply die may be a painful but ultimately necessary transition into whatever naturally comes next. I guess when dealing with a chosen one, it's important to consider just who did the choosing. Have I mentioned how much I like this book? So, I'm glad I was playing Dreamfall when I was writing the script for my last video, because when I saw what became of April, my pen came to a screeching halt, and I realized her story was far more complex than it first seemed. April never got her happy ever after at the end of the fairy tale. 
It was actually heavily implied by Lady Alvane when she rescued April in a moment of seeming deus ex machina that this would be the case. Once April was no longer the instrument of fate and she had to figure out her own path again, things got sticky. She didn't go back home and have a great reunion with her family, or finally get together with Charlie and make it as an artist. Far from it, in fact. She abandoned Stark and her old life entirely for one in Arcadia. And given all she'd done in the name of Mercuria, she wasn't about to stand around and let a bunch of bullies oppress the magical races within the city. And ten years of war have changed April a lot. One early and striking revelation is that she has taken lives. In The Longest Journey, the most she did was trip the Gribbler so it fell into its own cooking fire and trap Roper Clax in a calculator. But now, she's a fighter. And to the Azadi, she's a dangerous terrorist. April's priorities seem to have shifted somewhat too. She seems resentful of the role fate thrust upon her in the previous game. And so, when Zoe does show up and the implications of something threatening the balance presents itself, she flat out rejects it and moves to send Zoe back to Stark as quickly as possible. This may seem at odds with the scrappy girl who trudged across half of Arcadia to find the Alation people, but there's some sense to it. I mean, ten years is a long time after all, and people do change a lot. April took the initiative in getting involved with the Azadi fight, versus being pulled into the previous struggle for the balance. She's grown close with the Magicals, being something of a special creature herself. She clearly has no taste for this kind of injustice, and this is a monumental struggle against a much more powerful foe. So it's little to no surprise that she feels she doesn't have time for the balance when she has so much resting on her shoulders and so many people to care for. While for us, the player, April's transformation is a little shocking, especially playing the games back to back. We do learn some things about her transformation from Crow. This wisecracking bird was April's sidekick and skeleton key for a lot of puzzles back in the first game, and he recounts to Zoe some of the story that happened between the two games, right up to the point where April basically walked out of his life. In the end, people change, and so does the world. And when it happens, we can't simply go back to how things were before. All we can do is keep moving forward into whatever comes next. April has become a driven and very competent woman, which does beg the question, what's this all about? Find April. Save April. There's no damsel in distress here. In fact, it's April who breaks Zoe out of the evil tower, but not before bumping into this guy. They believe they have a right to impose their politics and religion on others, and they even believe that we should be grateful for it. We'll talk more about Kian in the next video, I think. So, we're going to be tackling two things here. First are the changes to the worlds of Stark and Arcadia, and second, the presentational bump the game got from being ported to new technology. So why don't we start with the fun stuff? Both Stark and Arcadia have changed a lot. Of course, we are introduced to this wonderful new hub world of Casablanca at the start of the game, and compared to Newport, it seems so full of light and has a very positive, upbeat vibe to it. The towers on the horizon have this striking utopian feel. Now, yes, we could see some of that in parts of Newport, but we spent most of our time seeing exactly what that world has been built directly on top of. And in Casablanca, even down at the bottom, it seems like a pretty nice place to live. It's safe, it's clean, it's comfortable. And yeah, there were definitely similar vibes in April's Venice, but this place feels like it caters to wealthier tastes. People with the money to buy a nice house, providing it's a little out of the city centre, and who take on a longer commute in exchange for extra comfort. Kinda like... Hmm, Zoe's dad. We only visit a few locations in this area, all told, including Liv's shop, which is small and messy and feels like you could find anything you wanted if you spent enough time rummaging around in there, Zoe's kickboxing school, where we get our first taste of the combat mechanics, and a nice coffee shop. And while we only spend a small amount of time here, 
sense. We should probably be aware of just how thin the illusion of peace and safety in this world actually is. Go, go, go! Hands behind your head! Listen, I, I warned you! Sure, the police in Newport didn't mess around either, but this is some next level Soviet North Korea shit right here. Even in such a nice part of the city, the eye is clearly very powerful, and concepts like human rights don't really matter to them. People may not be living in fear of just being picked up off the street and disappearing at night, but it's quite clear that things like that do happen. As a returning player though, things started to get really exciting for me when I finally got to return to Old Venice and... Ouch. We discover through playing the game that there was a kind of global event called The Collapse that happened 10 years ago, right around the time April Ryan vanished off the face of Stark, and, as some of us may be aware, two dragons fought to the death in the skies above Newport, and a new Balance Guardian ascended to protect the two worlds. While it's never explained what the collapse actually was, we know that things like interstellar travel became impossible, and even super-fast airborne travel on Earth suddenly stopped working. This is actually a pretty fascinating event, specifically because so little is actually said about it, and a lot of people don't really remember what actually happened. Zoe herself was kept inside by her father, which implies something changed in the sky, but what actually happened is a mystery. In the wake of this, places like Venice have fallen into ruin, and the student boarding house that was once a sanctuary for young progressive minds looking to change the world is now a crack house full of dangerous people. The only place that seems to have survived is... I'm all scrubbed and ready to work, sir. And look who's running the show. So, it seems dance didn't exactly work out for Charlie. And when the harsh reality of rent and bills came calling, right. he fell into something else. You know now, if you watch this video on my channel, you'll know I wouldn't consider this to be any kind of failure. Charlie took a journey. And maybe he didn't end up where he thought he was going. But he had a great life experience and made some lifelong friends along the way. And in the end, he landed on his feet. Honestly, it was great to see his change though he's clearly affected somewhat by April's disappearance. Emma also puts in a brief appearance, and she, much more so than Charlie, hasn't been able to let April go. In Arcadia, the occupation by the Azadi has led to things taking a pretty sharp downturn there too. But can we just take a moment to appreciate this? So, with the power of the Xbox gone are the beautiful pre-rendered backgrounds from The Longest Journey, now replaced with equally beautiful full 3D environments. It's a big transformation, and revealed very well indeed. When Zoe first arrives in Arcadia, she's deep underground in a vast cavern, Forgotten City-style complex. And it's only when she's figured out the riddle of this place that she's able to emerge somewhere else. Somewhere that hints at familiarity, safety, somewhere we've maybe been before. Open one more door, and we are back in the Journeyman Inn, and standing in the presence of Benrime Selim, a woman who played no small part in April's journey. She's certainly looking a lot better at this point, and our initial exit into Mercuria is this grand spectacle that only hints at the troubles ahead. Just for a moment, we can enjoy this wondrous place once again, and maybe get a little sense of coming home. I mentioned in my first video about my absolute love of pre-rendered backgrounds, and their ability to capture a scene, but there's definitely a limitation to what can be expressed through static images. Seeing Arcadia rendered in full 3D like this, and just being able to look around and walk through doors and around corners that were previously concealed from view, really pushes the sense of scale and wonder in this city. And since we've segued into graphics here, well, you may have noticed the character models are significantly better this time around too. 
In The Longest Journey, the characters were very low poly, but were very easy to read. This is one of those shining through your limitations rather than being held back by them moments. The artists leaned into how little they could actually express on any single model, and so focused on making sure each model was unique and communicated what it was very clearly. There's a worry that when those limitations get removed, people can get lazy or maybe too excited and begin over-designing characters so that they just look like a cluttered mess and don't communicate anything important. I'm happy to say that's not the case here at all. All of that extra power has been put to great use. I mean, just look at April's hand-me-down Arcadia does from the first game. Now, look at her here. This is a woman ready for battle. She looks far more mature and focused than her previous incarnation. It would have been easy to add things like buckles and straps or a stupid shoulder pad because it might look cool, but stuff like that only takes away from a design rather than adding to it. Her getup is simple and easy to read. It's clearly meant for outdoors and comfortable movement, and probably provides more protection than you'd realize. Seriously, gambesons, for example, despite being just layered fabric, were pretty useful in a scrape. See this video for more details. The main problem though is the animations, especially the faces. This is, of course, a limitation of the Xbox and not a complaint that's unique to this game. But yeah, we've got moving mouths and not much else, which definitely feels pretty robotic and somewhat in the uncanny valley. Still, as Mass Effect Andromeda taught us, it's just as possible to mess up going the other way as well. So aside from a few low resolution textures here and there, and some robotic animations, I'd say the presentational upgrade is one of this game's strongest points. And while I'll always love my pre-rendered backgrounds, I enjoyed exploring this Mercuria a lot more than I did the one in The Longest Journey. So, as I said, we step out into our winter wonderland and start to think maybe it's all gonna be okay. Which is why it really sucks when we start to see stuff like this. The city is now fully occupied by the Azadi, and the Temple of the Balance and the Sentinel Priesthood who guided April Ryan through her journey to save the balance are no more. In place of the temple now stands a towering edifice built in the name of the Azadi Goddess, and the Azadi enforced their religious belief ruthlessly on the people of the North. Mercuria was once a haven for all races. As a major port city, it was a melting pot of culture and religion. Now humans and magicals are segregated with non-human magicals confined to a ghetto that is regularly raided and its occupants taken away for re-education. Sounds kind of familiar. Within though, we see signs that life is carrying on as best it can. The magicals still run their market and still trade, albeit less openly, in their crafts and talents. Arcadia is the real nostalgia hub of the game. Of course, it's where we find April and Crow, but we also bump into other returning characters, such as the now reformed, wink, Ropaclax. Yes, the evil alchemist whom April trapped in a calculator has escaped, amended his ways, and even wrote a book about it. I have mixed feelings about this, actually. On one hand, it was a much needed break in the tension and a wonderful callback to the longest journey. On the other, it is a little jarring when compared to the rest of the game. I mean, things get very dark by the end of this. While we don't travel as far across Arcadia as we did in the previous game, we do get to spend a lot more time with the Dark People, and even visit their grand floating city, which is where the reborn White Dragon now resides. We didn't really get to learn much about the Dark People in The Longest Journey, on account of only spending a very brief time with them, and them not really wanting April to bother them. Here, we finally get to learn about their culture, purpose, and even their sleeping arrangements. The Dark People are collectors of stories. Written stories, to be precise. Any kind of story, in any kind of language, that is written, painted, carved into stone, or written in sand with a finger, is the purpose of their existence. The Dark People, by their own admission, do not make stories themselves. They only gather, store, and read all the stories from all the races across Arcadia. And I could see this being a wonderful retirement plan for myself. I just need enough money to construct a colossal floating library, and I'll be sorted. Only when the final words have been written, and the worlds of Stark and Arcadia are reunited, will they rest from their task. 
So this was a great ride all in all. There were plenty of deep cuts and lore expansion for returning players, while still being a great introduction to the world for new people. On top of that, we got a big improvement to visual quality that made this trip just as enchanting as our first one. So this is a big one. In truth, as well as wanting to finally explore these worlds, a big reason I chose to do a series on The Longest Journey is that each game is a kind of milestone marking the progression of the adventure game as a whole through the years. For better or worse, each game was released on a different console generation and was made with a somewhat different audience in mind. Each of the Dreamfall entries has some experimental features and these land with varied success. The Longest Journey was a point and click adventure game. This is a very well established genre and people basically know what they're going to get from these right down to how the game controls. Adventure game, however, well, let's take a break for a second. Go ahead and open a browser window. No, seriously, you'll enjoy this. And search for something like original Xbox, PS2, or early 2000s adventure games. And then, after you're done gushing over the list of absolute bangers that show up, this could take some time, but I'll wait. Why don't you tell me if you can figure out what the fuck an adventure game actually is? Because searching those terms, I find RPGs, immersive sims, action and stealth games, and sure, all of these are adventures. Hell, Animal Crossing is kind of an adventure, right? But they don't give us a clear idea of what an adventure game actually is. So without the point and click element, we really are heading into unknown territory. Honestly, aside from Shadow of Destiny, I'm struggling to think of any other games in this era that remotely resemble Dreamfall. Much like the first game, I'd say that when judged completely on its own merits, Dreamfall is just fine. It's clearly here to tell a story first, and it's both an incredible story and very well told. At the time of its release, it was one of a very small number of, mostly, non-combat narrative adventure games that was trying to offer an original take on the point-and-click adventure game, and update the old genre for consoles and new technology. In that regard, I'd say it succeeded. But as before, I'm also interested in how it holds up in 2022, and what someone trying to make something similar now might want to take, and might want to leave. Despite the change in control scheme, our two big returning features are conversations and inventory puzzles. This game does have combat and stealth mechanics too, but... Well, we'll get to them later. So, both the returning features have been streamlined, and some might say, dumbed down. Certainly, there's no more unintuitive moon logic puzzles, and while that's a great thing, we may have swung the needle a little too far the other way depending on how you look at it. Basically, there's pros and cons to this, and we need to talk about them both. So, let's talk about those conversations. In the last video, I talked about how conversation trees are basically pointless. There's a few games like Vampire or Persona where the choices you make here will have serious gameplay implications, and then... One moment you're running like the wind, then you've suddenly turned around and are giving him the finger, furiously, with both hands. Why? There's this game. Oh yeah, this is happening very soon. But for the most part, it's just a big list of stuff to click on every now and then without really thinking about it. So in Dreamfall, they're more or less gone. Not entirely, but they're cut back to a bare minimum and some of the choices you get given are one-time only deals which lock you out of other choices later. So this is a lot less cumbersome overall, but... And this is a big but. While they removed all the conversation trees, they didn't cut back on the overall amount of dialogue. So you're going to spend a lot of time just watching people talk. Now, I'm not 100% sure on how much of a criticism this is. After all, this is what you should expect from a game like this. You're basically playing a movie, moving between set pieces and solving some challenges along the way. This is exactly what you'll be doing in a point and click adventure, only instead of clicking through topics, you're just getting the whole conversation delivered in one click. As with the first game, the voice acting is on point, and thanks to the full 3D environments, the camera can easily jump around and do close-up and dramatic shots to keep the scenes interesting to watch. But you are still watching something versus playing something. And while... 
that's okay. I just feel like maybe we could be doing a little better. Puzzles have also been massively simplified, which is both a good and bad thing. The positive here is gameplay flow and pacing. We are able to move from scene to scene at a good pace and uncover this story without having to spend hours standing around scratching our heads, revisiting every area of the game for something we might have missed, trying to combine every item in our inventory with everything else, before finally tabbing into a browser, looking up the answer and screaming, how the hell was I expected to figure that out? But the problem was never the complexity of the puzzles, as it was if they were intuitive or not. The Longest Journey had a kind of layered puzzle design. What I mean is this. Let's imagine your game has a door, and you need a blue key to unlock it. So, before we can open the door, we need to find the key. The key is in a guard's coat pocket, so we need to get rid of the guard. The guard is thirsty, so maybe we can slip him something in a drink. So, we need to find a drink, and something to slip into it, and so on. We can add more steps going further and further back until we have several hours of game in a relatively small area. This part is fine, providing it's within our power to reasonably deduce each step along the road to success. Following each step requires exploration and maybe interactions with characters, which creates an opportunity for world building. The problem with some puzzles in The Longest Journey, and a lot of these old school games, is that the alien logic that the puzzles were built around just made them insufferable to deal with, and is a big reason why the genre fell from grace. So, in Dreamfall, most of that is gone. There aren't many steps from lock to key, and you usually have some clear idea of what you need and a good idea of where to find it. In a lot of cases too, we're going into minigame territory. Zoe has a hacking tool for electronic locks, and a lockpick for others. Clearly, she graduated from the JC Denton School of Awesome. These are not particularly bad. The lockpick game is overall more fun than the hacking one, and both are about on a par with any other hacking minigame. These are a little overused if you ask me, especially at the start of the game. There are several points early on where Zoe comes up against a lock that's a grade higher than her current version of the hacking software. but. Rather than go through some elaborate system of puzzles to get the upgrade, you just need to call your hacker friend back in Casablanca and have her drop a big update onto your phone, which is almost completely pointless. Most of the puzzles are pretty straightforward. Like when you need a ticket for this cable car in Hokkaido, you clearly see this guy tear up a ticket and throw it in the garbage. While Zoe comments that these things automatically incinerate rubbish every few minutes, there's no timer on the puzzle, and you don't need to find any special tool to fish the ticket halves out of the bin. You just need to click on it a couple of times and then find something to stick the two halves together with. So, while something is gained, something is lost. There's not a whole lot of challenge here, and your enjoyment will really depend on what you want most out of the game. I'm a story first gamer, but I still want a game to play and there were definitely times when I felt like this game was trying my patience in that regard. There's a later point in the game where all three playable characters are converging on the same point for a big climactic moment, and all you have to do is walk each one to the same place and maybe have a conversation with someone along the way. Now sure, a big convoluted puzzle here would have killed the pacing, but having basically nothing to do other than taxi three different characters to the same place, with no way to divert from the path or enact any kind of player agency on the scene, was also incredibly frustrating. So, it's definitely not perfect, but in the interest of enjoying the story, I guess it's okay. The stealth and the combat though, that's another story. So I don't want to dwell on this area too much, because it's quite clear that the developers didn't either. But Dreamfall has both basic combat and stealth, and a game over condition. And with the exception of one section where April is sneaking through some ruins filled with dangerous creatures, they're not very well implemented, and not at all fun to use. I don't think I need to go into too much detail about just how hard it is to nail down good combat in a game. If you've watched my series on the Legacy of Kane games, you'll know that their combat was a real mixed bag of hits and misses that changed from game to game. I'm honestly not sure what these things are doing here. I'm wondering if they were mandated by forces higher up the chain of command, or if Ragnar was looking to experiment and just didn't have time to get it right. Either way, the combat is really stiff and clunky, both in its controls and animations. 
and the stealth is the worst kind, which is forced upon you in certain set pieces but completely useless outside of those, and uses a simple stay hidden or die condition. That is to say, if you are seen, you're dead, and you're going to have to go through the entire game over screen process and reload your save. It really doesn't add anything to the game at all, if I'm being honest. It's not that all the stealth scenes are bad, as I said, there is at least one good one, but this isn't an immersive sim. You don't get to choose how you approach a problem and progress to the next set piece. This is one specific key for one specific lock, and all the doors open in a very specific order. So yeah, it's not good, and I'd rather just leave it there than try to make any larger point about it. Sometimes people just make mistakes. Fortunately, these systems aren't used all that frequently, and so aren't all that invasive to the experience. Dreamfall was a great experience overall, but while many things were gained in the presentation department, some things were lost in the overall gameplay. Some straight up mistakes were made too, but I can't exactly blame Funcom for wanting to experiment with a formula, especially since they were heading into unknown territory. The difficulty needle definitely swung too far in the wrong direction this time too. However, I do think we need to look at the larger world in which the game was being developed at the time. Point and click adventures had died out for several reasons, and absurd moon logic puzzles had played a part in that. My guess is that Ragnar and other devs working on the project had to consider this when making the game, and how comparisons to point and click adventures might impact marketing given the unfavourable way those games were viewed at the time. Game development, especially large expensive titles, just isn't as simple as having a vision and sticking to it. Zoe's story has a very interesting ending. I mean, we know where she ends up from the very start of the game, and she is in fact now in a space between the realms of Stark and Arcadia, telling this very story to this gentleman right here. It's a kind of cliffhanger ending. Much like with Legacy of Cain and Deus Ex Mankind Divided, there was a sense of the battle is over, but the war is not yet won. And if you stick around, there's more to come down the line. Only, there wasn't because that larger world once again shoot things up. While Dreamfall did just fine commercially, it wasn't the money making powerhouse of say, an MMORPG, and Funcom made the decision to switch up their focus from single player adventures into online multiplayer games, with their major entry to this market being Age of Conan. While a concept for Dreamfall chapters already existed, Ragnar was moved on to working on The Secret World, which is a solid MMORPG and I recommend you give it a try sometime, but this meant we wouldn't hear anything from Zoe, April, Stark or Arcadia for 7 years. And next time, we'll be seeing if that final product was worth the wait, as we finish our exploration of the world divided in two, and see the ultimate conclusion of these stories in Dreamfall Chapters. Leaving your game on a cliffhanger isn't exactly a great idea. As much as I love the concept of games that can tell stories on the same scale and over as much time as comics and TV series, it just isn't practical. Even if your series is considered a safe bet, it could only take a single entry to underperform and a project could be stripped away from a creative lead or even an entire studio. IPs are generally owned by publishers, and since they hold the license and the purse strings, it can lead to situations like Adam Jensen's story being held in limbo, or a prolific crime writer being trapped beneath a dark ocean for an indefinite amount of time. The legendary and infinitely powerful Four Horsemen of the Apocalypse couldn't escape this either. Even after Gunfire Games managed to secure the rights to finish what they started years ago, they still haven't finally closed the book on this one though they've no one to blame but themselves for not spending their extra life wisely, and the same goes for Shenmue. There's also the real world to consider. Time passes and markets and audiences change, and of course studios change too. Priorities shift and publishers especially are eager to chase down trends and money. This is pretty much what happened with Funcom after Dreamfall was finished. The company had, and continues to have, great success with their MMO, Age of Conan. 
And while I'm not a player myself, I know a few people who are, and it sounds like great fun. As such, the studio wanted to pivot more into developing online experiences, and had a big project lined up called The Secret World. So Ragnar was shipped off to lead development on that, and Zoe's story was abandoned to an undetermined fate. Seven years passed, and the only thing anyone who worked on The Longest Journey could say about its future was, to have faith. In 2012, Ragnar finally broke away from Funcom and began his own independent studio, Red Thread Games. A studio with one simple mission, to create games with a soul, something I can get behind 100%. The first order of business was securing the Longest Journey license from Funcom and making Dreamfall chapters. To remove the insipid influence of a publisher from the equation, Red Thread took to Kickstarter to get funding from actual fans of the game and in turn make the conclusion that everyone wanted. The campaign was a success, raising over $1.5 million, a relatively small sum in game development, but it was enough to get things started. Dreamfall chapters released over a period between 2014 and 2017, and while its limited budget definitely showed, Arcadia and Stark had never looked better. Zoe finally awakened from her coma, and the feints of Kian Alvane and April Ryan were finally laid bare for all to see. And so at last, we are here to see how it all played out in the end. This is Dreamfall Chapters. So the spoilers for both Longest Journey and the original Dreamfall start here. I'm sorry, but as with the previous video, that's just the way it has to be. We really can't move forward talking about character and world development here without having some idea of where we started. I do have some comments to make on the conclusion of this story and about one character in particular who shows up in the late game towards the end of this... saga. So there will be a chapter specific spoiler section towards the end of the video that will be signposted with big warning flags for your convenience. So now that we're all on the same page, Let's start at the most important thing to happen in Dreamfall and say... April Ryan... is dead. So, in the biggest twist of fate, Zoe, for all intents and purposes, failed in her mission to save April Ryan. Though, Ragnar does seem to disagree. And most importantly, we will conclude the story of Zoe Castillo, the girl who saved the world, and who saved April Ryan. I wonder where that's going. Zoe also failed to stop Watikorp from releasing a dangerous new product called The Dream Machine. An interactive entertainment device that lets you dream anything you want and experience those dreams as though they were real, and in the case of Zoe, somehow sent her skyrocketing off beyond the divide that separates Stark from its sister world and landing slap in the middle of Arcadia. She did however manage to expose certain very dangerous parts of the tech. For example, this guy was using it to plug into other people's minds and even devour their dreams, leaving them as breathing, soulless husks. Why does that sound familiar? She also freed the spirit of Faith, a girl raised in a lab and used as patient zero for the dream machine. When Faith was given a massive dose of the sedatives that were being used in the experiments, the very same ones that put Zoe into a coma at the end of the game, she was able to project herself into the dream net where she existed as a glitch or white noise that could disrupt the dreaming. There were some twists and turns along the way, including a surprise connection between Zoe, Faith, and the woman responsible for running the experiments. Both Zoe and Faith, you see, are something called a dreamer. Someone who is very powerful in the dreaming world. Which is actually where we meet Zoe at the beginning of Dreamful Chapters. In the previous game, Zoe's powers only allowed her to send her consciousness across the Divide and project herself into Arcadia, though only the White Dragon seemed able to notice that there was something off about her. How fascinating! You're here, and yet you're not. Can I touch you? Some time has passed since Zoe fell into a coma, and her time in the magical space called the Story Time has awakened several new abilities in her. Abilities she's been putting to good use. 
The Longest Journey draws inspiration from Australian Aboriginal creation myths that state that the universe was dreamed into existence and everything we experience is just a dream or imagined story of some sleeping god. Kind of interesting when you consider this. Because that's how the story goes, April. You escape, you outrun your pursuers, and your journey continues. It's been written, and we cannot change that now. There's a lot more of that coming. So, Zoe is a dreamer, a very special person able to manipulate the dreams of others, and with so many people now hooked into Watikorp's dream time, there's a lot of problems with nightmares now. That's how we come to the revelation that Zoe, far from feeling trapped outside of her body, has actually chosen to stay within the story time, where she feels she can do the most good to help people whose dreams are being slowly twisted up and devoured by... Well, that's a spoiler. Lastly, and just as important, is a young man we only briefly got to know back in Dreamfall named Kion. He was a devout apostle, a kind of holy warrior and assassin to his church, and a patriot in his homeland of Azadir. That is, until he actually ventures out into the world and gets a sense of what his people are really doing to the inhabitants of Mercuria. This leads to him refusing to kill April and being taken into custody as a traitor. This is where our game actually starts, with Zoe in the story time and Kian rotting in a prison cell awaiting his trial. Of course, if they were to both just stay where they are and let nature take its course, we wouldn't have much of a game now, would we? So, Zoe will ultimately awaken to start a new life in the region of Propast in the mega city of Europolis, and Kian will be sprung from his cell and drafted into what remains of the Magical Rebellion in Mercuria. And while this is, without a doubt, the darkest entry in the series, he will rise to become a champion among their number and ultimately discover the terrible truth of what his people are really doing here. Zoe, meanwhile, begins her journey suffering from memory loss from her coma, but will soon find herself embroiled once again with Watikorp and the Dream Machine, before finally crossing over into Arcadia, facing some of the most terrifying creatures therein, bumping into a few old acquaintances, and discovering the truth of where her power comes from, and who her great enemy really is. And that's not all. You see, at the start of the game we see this strange old house. A house that exists at a crossroads. A place called the House of All Worlds. We hear the cries of a newborn baby, and we see a shift open. Peppered throughout the story, we'll meet this baby, a girl named Saga and we'll watch her grow into a young woman. We'll learn about her dreams and see how she becomes a very important person by the end of this story, and indeed, many, many others. So yeah, as stories go, this one's a banger. It's not perfect, but it was well worth starting the journey with April to see how it all played out in the end. Zoe has grown up a hell of a lot since we met her in Dreamfall. While at the start of the game she's lost much of her memory circulating the events of the previous game and her time after in the story time, she's not the same directionless youth we met living off her father's dime and spending all day watching TV in her underwear that we met at the start of the last game. Quite the opposite actually. Zoe is now doing her absolute damnedest to build her new life and maybe even recover some of what was lost in her coma. As to what she's doing with her time, this is actually one of the game's early choices. When facing her inner neuroses just before she wakes up, she has to decide how she's going to move forward with her life from here. She can choose to embrace something familiar and comfortable, or go after something new. The outcome of this will have Zoe working in one of two different places in the game, which will have some implications on events later as well. In her spare time, she also volunteers helping out one of the political parties, so it seems she's even gotten herself something of a cause to fight for now. There's actually quite a bit of room for headcanon, role-playing, and emergent storytelling here too. During certain conversations, there are several dialogue options you can choose from when responding to certain questions, and while they don't have any significant impact on the story, they do tell you something about the Zoe you are playing. One example is a conversation she has with this character, Queenie who is an important figure in the local pro pass community, whose influence could secure a lot of votes for the party Zoe is working for, and who is definitely not some kind of criminal. 
She's just a very well-respected businesswoman with a lot of influence over the Chinese community. I mean, could you imagine respectable politicians colluding with criminals to try to get more votes? What kind of dystopian hell is this? During this conversation, Zoe will be challenged on her motives for helping this particular party, especially with them being the major rival to the current ruling powers in the upcoming election. There's a selection of answers here, and all of them are basically right. That is to say that the choice you make here won't have any profound impact on the game. You won't fail a mission or be locked out of something later. It will just say something about your Zoe personally, and about the journey you are taking with her. Either way, Zoe isn't just a girl drifting through life who simply gets swept up in something much bigger than herself this time. She's a much more mature protagonist, and much more willing and able to assert her will on the story. This is exemplified by one of my favourite moments in the game, when we finally return to the House of the Gribbler that we visited with April all that time ago, and find something far worse is now residing there. The Gribbler, and indeed Roper Clax you see, were ultimately the playthings of a more powerful and sinister creature called the Yaga. He once was an associate of ours. We call him Baba Yaga. No, not that Yaga. This Yaga. This is something of a late game encounter that takes place after Zoe has recovered her memory, rediscovered her purpose, and crossed over into Arcadia to take care of business once and for all. That's just how our girl rolls now. You got a problem with that? Well, you might be shit out of luck. Especially if you exist on the cusp of reality and the story time because that's where Zoe can manifest her Jedi powers. In fact, let's just contrast this with something in Dreamfall. Here's young Zoe being held by the eye, utterly terrified of what might happen to her if these corporate bullies take a dislike to her. Now, here she is dealing with the literal source of children's nightmares. That is some heavy character development right there. And this time we actually got to come along for the whole ride and see how our hero grows. So when Zoe is challenged by the Yaga, she's basically asked to nourish it with her sins, to confess what she regrets and let the Yaga eat it up. This is another of those moments where the choices only really matter in a role-playing sense. It might seem at the start like the Yaga has got you pinned in a corner and not doing what it wants could bring down that oh-so-terrible game over screen, but I didn't let that stop me from politely telling the old hag to go suck a dick. Sorry, I mean that I had nothing to offer her. I'm a man who lives without regrets. My demons and I have had some very long conversations, and I ultimately accept and even love them. Yes, in my 40 years of life on this planet, I've done a whole heap of incredibly stupid stuff. But to forget or wish any of that away is to both invite a chance for it to happen again, and to fundamentally change something about who I am now. I am the sum of all my good and bad experiences, and to lose a bad one would be just as devastating as losing a good one. So, I think we need to carry all our mistakes with us and learn from them. None of us should have regrets. Only memories and lessons learned. Not me. Not you. Not this girl. Not even this guy. Maybe this asshole. I guess I'm saying this is a very satisfying arc. Between the two games, we see this directionless girl pull her shit together and venture into some very dangerous territory. We've seen so many sides to her at this point. There's the girl who dared break into a crack house run by violent criminals, no doubt somewhat unaware of how much danger she really was in, and motivated by a need to save someone she cares for. We've seen her heartbreak at the discovery of the horrific captivity and exploitation of Faith, and when she stood in the presence of an angry ghost straight out of some Japanese horror movie, she offered it only care and compassion, and agreed to stay with her for as long as she wanted. Zoe has travelled across the expansive fantasy vistas of Arcadia, taken to the skies in an airship, and stood face to face with the Mother of Nightmares, and every step of the way, she's grown and pushed closer into her final form becoming the person she needs to be to stand against the game's ultimate enemy. If you want an example of a great protagonist, here she is. If you're wondering what Red Thread games mean when they talk about telling stories with a soul, take a look at Zoe's rap sheet. But Zoe is not the only big player on the board here. Every queen needs a knight, and that's how we come to Kian Alvane. Interesting name. Welcome 
April Ryan. I won't ask how you know my name, but who are you? The Lady Elvane is my name now. That's coming back later. So we met Kian first in Dreamfall, and while he was one of our three playable characters, we didn't control him all that much. When we met him, he was a devout apostle of the Azadi goddess, and the interesting thing about him was the disconnect between what the Azadi, especially in Azadia, think is going on in the north, and what is really happening there. It's especially interesting because other characters, upon hearing of Kian's arrival, actually worry about him becoming sympathetic with the rebels, which implies they don't believe the shit they're shoveling at all. Kian believed that the Azadi saved Mercuria and are now standing as its protectors, spreading the light of their goddess to the blind and keeping them safe from magicals. He got a sharp reality check about that when he finally saw firsthand what things were like in Mercuria and had a lengthy conversation with a strong-headed young woman we've all spent quite a bit of time with at this point. It sounds like you do not think much of the Azadi. I don't. They're arrogant and full of themselves. They believe they have a right to impose their politics and religion on others, and they even believe that we should be grateful for it. So when he refuses to fulfill his duties as an assassin and kill her, he is arrested, and we meet him locked up in a cell, feeling sorry for himself. Kion's journey takes him from reluctantly joining the rebel forces and rising from the status of barely trusted errand boy to champion to leader. It's something of a classic redemption arc. We learn about his harsh upbringing on the streets of Azadia, clashing with gangs of other homeless kids and how he was ultimately saved and given a second chance by the church. It certainly explains his blind faith in the cause. The church and the goddess aren't just abstract concepts to him. They are forces that literally saved his life, lifted him out of poverty and violence, and transformed him into a man with a purpose. So far from seeing his own defection as betraying what the goddess stands for, he now sees the persecution of the magicals in Mercuria as betrayal by his own people. He believes that sinister forces, exemplified by this Darth Vader character called the Prophet, have infiltrated his faith and are now twisting it around. He's half right, I suppose. But he also gets one hell of a reality check on religion in general as the game progresses. So, he believes his rebellion is actually in the name of the Goddess. That being said, the Azadi prejudice against magicals actually comes from a fierce rivalry between them and the Dalmari people. This is important because Kian's progress as a character is best exemplified through his relationship with this guy, Liho, a one-eyed Dalmari who has a particular grudge against Kian. Where did we meet? You murdered my father in front of me. Their relationship goes from strength to strength. At first, Liko expects Kion to simply run back to his old masters like a good dog, but as time passes and Kion proves himself, a modicum of trust and respect begins to form, and that slowly becomes a real bond of brotherhood. The initial stages of their relationship stem from Liko swearing unto his own gods that he will slay Kion himself when this war is over, and so he does not wish to be denied his prize. But it becomes apparent that this is a lot of bluster and also Liko's way of keeping something that really scares him at arm's length. You see, as with Zoe, there are certain choices that you can make in Kion's story that say something about him and his relationship with other characters. A very late game choice concerns bringing the angry Dalmari on a mission with you, and agreeing to do so will access this scene. Kion, are you awake? I wasn't. This has now changed. Did I ever tell you how my society views people like us? I don't believe so. The Dole and Tiqua consider themselves tolerant and inclusive in all matters. And yet I've always had to hide who I am from my family and friends. So if that was a little too subtle for you, Kian just comes out and says it later too. So. Did you and April ever hook up? You know, mate, copulate? No. Bird, you need to learn common decency. And I am gay. I don't mate with women. Now, none of this is relevant to the overall conflict, but I don't feel this was shoehorned in by any means. Compelling characters are at the heart of every struggle, and learning about who these big macho guys are under the hood makes them more relatable and three-dimensional. These are guys who've been through a lot of near-death situations together, and given all the slaughter they've seen, I doubt they'd really care to hold back about who they really are to each other. 
especially when it's clear that neither Dolmari culture or the Azadi religion are particularly tolerant or accepting of such things. So I've got to hand it to Ragnar and his writing team. The character writing in all these games has been absolutely spot on. And while there are some problems with the larger story writing, with the longest journey being somewhat cliched, and Dreamfall 1 and 2 having some plot holes, loose ends and unclear motivations for certain characters, I never got bored of these adventures because I wanted to spend time with these characters. I wanted to know what happened to them next and if they'd all make it out alive. So Arcadia now looks better than ever. In fact, all of the presentation does. It's not top notch for its era. We've got some crazy rigid hairstyles for example. And the previous problems we had with stiff animation and faces are also back, if slightly improved. But this is an indie game, so we need to accept limitations where we find them. The environmental design is just breathtaking though. And I've no doubt that what we see here is much closer to the visions the concept artists had for Arcadia back when they were making The Longest Journey than the pre-rendered backgrounds could show. The limitations the developers were working under are very much on display here. Not that anything about the presentation is especially cheap. I mean, there are some copy-pasted NPCs walking around the city, but there is very much a quality over quantity approach to world design here. The Longest Journey and Dreamfall were world-spanning adventures. In the first game, April visited the city of Mercuria and its surrounding areas, went on a seafaring adventure before discovering the underwater city of the Merum and the distant island of the Elation. Then in Dreamfall, Zoe started in Casablanca before moving to Newport to meet with Charlie and Emma, then went on to the Watikorp headquarters in Hokkaido and an abandoned factory in Russia. All of these areas were their own self-contained hubs with their own puzzles to solve and characters to interact with. The majority of chapters however takes place in two larger hub worlds, these being the Propast area of the megacity of Europolis and a larger chunk of Mercuria in Arcadia, with a couple of extra areas becoming available in the late game. As a massive Deus Ex and Bloodlines fan, I think it's safe to say that I'm all about hub worlds. I greatly prefer smaller locations that are exploited to their maximum potential versus massive sprawling locations that are basically Come empty. The limited number of variables that needs to be controlled in a smaller area means it's much easier to have things in the world react to the player's actions and imply the passage of time. Survival horror can do this by creating interesting ways for previously safe areas to once again have monsters to contend with instead of just having everything respawn because it's a game and it doesn't want things to get too easy. Deus Ex really nails this though in its Hell's Kitchen hub. While you're given free reign to tackle objectives however you want straight off the bat, this is the first major social hub where you can explore, get quests, hunt for items and generally go digging through nooks and crannies for content. And there's a hell of a lot of it. There's lots of people to talk to, things to see and situations to get mixed up in even foreshadowing some late game content by dropping a secret Majestic 12 base right in the sewers. Your second trip there though is after things have taken a turn for the worse and oh boy can you feel it when you're out and about. The streets are quieter, locations that were full before are now almost empty. There's a greater presence of soldiers in the street but most importantly every NPC who you can talk to has something to say about it. They're not just recycling stock lines, they are very aware that something has changed and that it's not good. Compare that with something like the Skyrim Civil War where the only thing that really changes is which uniforms the guards are wearing and everyone just gets back to business as normal. It would simply be too much work to have every NPC in a large open world say something unique about every possible variation of a larger convoluted plot, which is exactly why I prefer scaled down hub worlds. And in Dreamfall chapters, we get plenty of good reactivity here. First though, I've just got to take a moment to gush over this world design. I feel Mercuria got all the good stuff in Dreamfall. The majority of the locations in Stark were focused on displaying the more dystopian side of the world, and especially how things had changed after the mysterious collapse. Mercuria though, had this wonderful Winter Wonderland thing going on that really brought to mind Narnia in The Lion, the Witch and the Wardrobe, and also things like the opening of Fable 2. I mean, just look at this Chad here. 
Look at that swagger. You know he says, top of the morning to you, versus a simple hello. That's not to say that everything on the Stark side was lacking in spectacle. Casablanca was a great hub world, but when you compare it to Propast in Europolis, well, this place has got dystopian sci-fi written all over it. In a blog post, Ragnar referred to Europolis as poverty-stricken and thoroughly corrupt, and after spending some time here, I'm inclined to agree. It's currently election season in Propast, as evident by the billboards you can see plastered all over the place. Zoe is doing volunteer work to help out the Unity Party, who are the only strong opposition to the current and long-running powers of the Alliance of European Democrats. Sorry, communists. It seems even in a dystopian hellscape, you can't catch a break. Those would be the communists. Generally speaking, 40 million people got shot in the head during the World Revolution. But the communists... They all got shot in the head. Well, this particular thread of Zoe's life isn't super important, it does add some flavour to the world, especially when you see how the major quest revolving around this part of her life actually plays out. I won't spoil anything, but... Well, just take a look around and tell me if changing the name on the door of the mayor's office is really going to make a difference. So you can see that these guys from the last game are very much back. And remember that reactivity I told you about? Well, things just go from bad to worse. As you can expect, a lot of people aren't really happy with how the world is being run, and being at a moment of potential change is inciting a lot of action. I have my personal reservations about what fist and placard waving like this will actually achieve, beyond a sense of self-gratification and a dopamine rush. But you can't blame an oppressed mass for being angry at their oppressors and maybe wanting to… at least feel like they're doing something about it. After all, the alternative is… Yep, Watikorp went ahead and released their dream machine, and now the world is dealing with the consequences of that. Most specifically, dream junkies who have just had it and decided to check out of the world. And why not? If your reality really does suck 24-7, and you have the option of simply escaping into a fully immersive fantasy that's completely indistinguishable from the real thing, why wouldn't you? I believe that as a species, human beings define their reality through misery and suffering. The perfect world was a dream that your primitive cerebrum kept trying to wake up from. From a technical standpoint though, this particular hub is just rife with details. From the ad bots that, yes, they advertise to you as you're walking around, to the vending machines, the cool looking Google Glass video phones everyone uses, to this strange holographic sun that is apparently here to make up for the fact people can't actually see the real sun down here. Propast is absolutely jammed full of environmental storytelling. Each little area mixes up its lighting and mood to guide the play without the need for waypoints. While from the very start you can just run around and go see what's up, the story does a good job of taking you to each location in its own good time, giving you a good chance to get adjusted to the geography of the area. There's also this handy little map that will place little waypoints on your in-game map if you're struggling at the beginning, and plenty of foreshadowing going on here to the observant eye. For example, there are several ominous towers placed around the map that no one seems to know the purpose of beyond being important to do things. Players returning from Dreamfall will no doubt draw a comparison to these with the ominous steampunk contraptions that the Azadi were installing all over Mercuria for no specified reason. But even if this is your first game in the series, you can figure out almost straight away that these are going to be important later, and start taking mental notes of where they are for when it's time. Points of interest are highlighted with lighting and aesthetic changes, like the rusty industrial feel of this tech market, something that brings to mind the electronic markets in Akihabara in Tokyo, and sci-fi classics like Blade Runner. It's dark, it's grungy, and even feels a little dangerous. Contrast that with the Chinese market along the canal, it's bathed in a comfortable warm glow from countless paper lanterns, and watched over by the city's towering megastructures. The two places are distinctly different, and it'd be very clear which one of these two a mission objective might want you to visit, without having some overbearing map marker taking up space on your screen. In this way, you can navigate a few small blocks of clubs, shops and markets surrounded by people going about their business, or just trying to stick it to the man. 
and at least get some hint of the scale of this city that basically runs through all of Central Europe. So let's jump over to Arcadia now and see how things are there. Much like in Europolis, Arcadia reacts to the actions of Kian and his fellow rebels as the story progresses, with guard patrols ramping up and entire areas of the city being closed off and one area in particular being raided and destroyed. Yeah, remember how Dreamfall got really dark? Well, it gets so much worse here. While this is pretty epic, the downside is you spend a lot of time walking around quite a small section of the city, and sure, those other areas aren't doing anything at that point, and might simply confuse the player, but it does get a little boring. On the plus side though, the steampunk industrial revolution has really ramped up and those machines we encountered in Dreamfall have increased in number and complexity. This has the effect of looking great and feeling ominous. As you may recall, Stark and Arcadia exist as a way of keeping science and magic mostly separate and in a balance that isn't going to lead to the world devouring itself. So, seeing these complex steam machines in the first game came with an ominous sense of something being violated. Combine that with the Azadi hate of magic and magical races, and you start to get a hint of something very bad forming on the horizon. The sense of foreboding has really ramped up here, and we are finally tasked with dealing with what the hell all this stuff is and, believe me, things get weird. The sections in Mercuria in this game basically look like Dreamfall but nicer. Don't misunderstand, I'm not saying this is some kind of asset flip or HD coat on old models and textures, though this being an indie game I wouldn't begrudge them if they had done that. And the story and characters on this side of the divide are all spot on, but we have seen all of this before. Where Arcadia really starts to shine for me is in the late game, when Zoe finally crosses over and we begin her quest to find Abnaxus and the Dreamer. Actually getting into the little guy's house is a really nice callback to the longest journey, and it's also where we encounter another of the game's returning champions. But after that, Zoe follows in April's footsteps and begins her own Frodo Baggins-esque trek across Arcadia. What they do very well in this game, just like in the first Longest Journey, is make a few small areas feel like a grand rollicking adventure. You're not going to be riding a horse for hours across an empty wilderness, thank god. But we'll be revisiting the House of the Gribbler that has somehow managed to get much creepier, have a brief encounter with the lovable Ben Bandu, before trekking across the mountains to encounter a strange civilization, and finally meet our old friend, who lays down some really heavy shit for our girl about who she is and just how much danger the world is in. I've mentioned before about my particular liking for Abnaxus and his appearance in chapters only enhance that. For one, it's actually really impressive just how much the creature I imagined looking at this low poly model with no textures looks like the final form of him here. There's a lot of tragedy in chapters. A lot. I mean, people die. So many people. Things just go from bad to worse to worse, and unfortunately, even secluded away up here in the clouds, our little legend doesn't escape the overall sense of ending that this final entry has. When we meet him, he's clearly sick, and he mentions his family and the rest of his people have all moved on to another place. This linear time is poison to him, and it's not only killing him, but has now prevented him from ever following his people to wherever they went. He did all this so he could be here at this time and in this place to meet Zoe and help her in this final task to save the Dreamer. Now remember, the Ular experienced their entire existence in a single moment. That means from the moment he was born, Abnaxus knew that he would die alone on this mountain, far from his wife and his daughters, and knowing he can never see them again. While the mechanism of the Ular perception of time isn't clear, it still says a lot about this guy that despite everything, he is here waiting for Zoe and is content to turn to dust in a world that doesn't belong to him for the sake of something so much greater than himself. I could go on, but this was a wonderful final trip and a great send off to these two incredible and contrasting worlds. In that regard, I'm actually glad that this was a low budget indie game and not some sprawling AAA mess. Time and again we've seen how limitations bring out the very best in people versus stifling creativity. From the tight level design and pre-rendered backgrounds of Resident Evil, 
to the exceptional, one-of-a-kind stealth masterpiece that is Mark of the Ninja, and even the way Clay Entertainment restructured their entire game design philosophy to remove ideas that didn't work quickly and efficiently, and reduce crunch in their studio. When you've got all the money and a big team, and especially when you aren't the one who's going to have to pull double shifts unpaid to clean up your mess, there's a tendency to get extravagant and wasteful. Sure, I'd love to see more of Europolis and take an epic horse ride across Arcadia, stopping at every small village I pass en route to see what's up, but that would ultimately take focus away from our primary conflict, mess with the pacing, and create all kinds of other problems. So small, tight, and exploited to its maximum potential was definitely the way to go here. So, there's a lot to unpack here. Most of it good, some of it not so good, and some of it very par for the course. All three entries in this series came out on different generations and all were targeted at different audiences. The Longest Journey was a true point-and-click adventure game and targeted very much at a somewhat niche PC-only audience. While Dreamfall was an experiment in bringing the genre to consoles, keeping all the story beats while removing some of the elements of point-and-click adventures that had fallen out of favour by the time it released. Dreamfall Chapters is a Kickstarter project, which means it was made primarily for the backers. But it was also released in 2014, which means the new style adventure game had been somewhat codified by this point, and one studio in particular was dominating the market and setting the norms. That being Telltale Games. Now, I don't exactly like Telltale Games. Well, that's not true. I've only ever played A Wolf Among Us and Batman, and I love them both. I am, however, incredibly biased here. I am a massive fan of both Fables and Batman, and any good story set in those two worlds would be more than enough for me to buy the game. Honestly, the only thing they could have done better would have been to make a Judge Dredd game. I got me one of those, though. Bleeding hard liberals. Time to dispense some justice. So sure, there were some good stories in those games, and I had a blast playing them. And in the end, that's all that matters, right? But since I'm here to overthink and overanalyze things, I can honestly say that Telltale games are very shallow experiences, with weak mechanics and a very thin illusion of choice and consequence that actually feels more annoying than anything else. Honestly, what do I care if Harvey will remember that? He's welcome to. I'm Batman. He can come and have a go if he thinks he's hard enough. But we are not here to discuss Telltale games exactly. Dreamfall Chapters borrows much more from Dreamfall than it does those games, but some of that Telltale stuff does seep into this game too. Let's start with some of the good stuff though. First, the awful combat and stealth from Dreamfall are gone. Yes, there are a couple of areas where you have to move without being seen, but there's no game over condition. So if you mess up, you just get sent back to the start of the area. These are a little annoying, but I like them better than before. You see, we're not bringing in anything new here so much as we are reusing something we've already been doing, i.e. walking around, in a slightly different way. That's smart game design. Combat and stealth are huge mountains to climb for both developers and players. It takes a lot of work to get animations, timing, and hitboxes correct, as well as having your character express themselves through their movements. Players also need a lot of practice and repetition in order to get it right. Hence why games start with small groups of easy enemies and not a massive horde or a super boss. Could you imagine a game with a combat focus where within the first two minutes, before you've even had time to get really comfortable with the mechanics, they drop a giant ass boss fight on you? That would be awful game design. I'd certainly never play a game like that for... Holy fuck, 84 hours? So yeah, bringing in choppy combat just for a now and then use was not a smart move. Though. I'm glad they didn't do what David Cage does, and just turn all actions into QTEs. Now, who else commits that crime? So, we're following a very similar format to Dreamfall in terms of moving around and interacting with stuff. At the very start of the game, it feels like the difficulty needle is very much over in the Dreamfall side of things. You aren't tasked with doing much more than going to a certain place and maybe finding something pretty obvious. Later though, especially in Mercuria, there are a few head scratchers. Nothing with the layers or depth of the longest journey, but a few smaller conundrums that take a little thought and exploration to figure out. 
This little puzzle to rescue Crow from being burned alive during the Reap Moon Festival was one in particular that actually needed some old school out of the box thinking and a little exploration. It was especially tense because I honestly had no idea if there was a time limit on this or not. So, I guess it's a little better in this game than it was in the previous. But I think the thing we've really got to talk about is the conversations and the so-called choice and consequence that exists through this game. Some of this has definitely come over from Telltale Games, and in my opinion, there's quite a big issue with dialogue choices seemingly having some big impact on the story. Of course, in the real world, you can never be sure of how what you say will be received. This, however, is a game, and these choices are supposed to be some kind of engaging mechanic that will have an impact on my role-playing, and maybe even the greater story. So, I kind of need to be able to make an informed decision in order for that to work. One feature I do like that does help somewhat with my decision-making process is how you can hear a character's inner monologue as you hover over each choice. This is quite nice as it means the screen doesn't get all that cluttered with text, but you can still hear a longer explanation of what each prompt implies. However, unless there's some kind of very obvious good choice and very obvious bad choice, I don't see how any of these choices matter. I can just pick randomly and deal with the outcome. So, if I do get an outcome that I feel is good, I don't get to feel particularly clever about that because I didn't really figure anything out. I just saw several choices, skim read the prompts, and mashed whichever one seemed the least shit. On the other hand, if I don't like the outcome, I just end up feeling slighted and somewhat dejected that I've probably got to replay all, if not a significant chunk of the game, to have a chance at getting a better outcome next time. So, that's a big negative. Well, kind of. It would be if any of this actually mattered. Choice and consequence is kind of a big illusion in games, though some do it better than others for sure. The Stanley Parable does a great job of exposing what's under the hood in gameplay choices, and this video about Disco Elysium, a game which weaves the illusion of choice much better than most, goes into a lot of depth on the subject too. The point is that far from heading down a completely different track depending on which choice you make, you're actually heading down a parallel track going to exactly the same place. One track might be a bit shinier than another, but it's basically all going the same way. This is because it would be a monumental task to code a game that had true reactivity to every choice you made in it, and as I've mentioned several times now, Dreamfall Chapters is a low-budget indie game that was financed via Kickstarter, so we do need to check our expectations. There are some benefits to these systems though, especially in the role-playing department. Remember earlier when I was talking about the Yaga? Well, that kind of thing is really cool, and littered all around the game. Depending on what you say in these role-playing moments, you get this cute little balance has shifted prompt, which I guess is just chapter's way of doing X person will remember that, and is a visual cue to imply something important just happened when basically nothing did. But it adds a little weight to these role-playing moments. There are minor changes here and there depending on your choices, and the fate of some characters will hang in the balance, so there's definitely incentive to play through again and see the other outcomes. One example involves Kian interrogating an Azadi officer for information. You have the option of employing physical torture or blackmail to extract what you want from him. Now, make no mistake, this guy is an absolute piece of garbage who was having relations with a magical. A very young magical who clearly wasn't into it. And the punishment for being caught for that far outweighed any hurt I could put on him in this little shack. Regardless of which method you choose, you're going to get the information either way. And I personally use the threat of exposing him to extract the information and then let him go with instructions to report back to me every week with any intel the rebels could use. I had a vice on this guy's nuts, and I was happy to exploit it. Good job, I thought. Smart thinking. And Keon won't have the kind of PTSD that comes with committing horrific acts of torture, even on someone so deserving of such pain. Unfortunately, Liko thought that because torture wasn't used, the information couldn't be trusted, and that I should have straight up murdered the guy for his crimes and wasn't happy that I hadn't. While I get he's hot-headed, there's absolutely no way I could have predicted this outcome. I wasn't even aware that I'd have to show him any receipts when I was given this challenge. So Liko ignored my information regarding a raid on the magical ghetto, and a lot of rebels died as a result. I wound up feeling slighted by the game after that. That being said, were I to do it all again, I still probably wouldn't torture the guy. Kion just doesn't strike me as the type. 
and maybe that's the real point after all. It's less about knowing and choosing what's going to give you the best story outcome, and more about role-playing a character, making decisions based on what you know now, and just dealing with how it plays out down the line. The game, however, does get it right just as much as it pulls this Witcher 3 bullshit on you. I think one of the best examples was actually a moment where I didn't do something and there was a consequence. There's a mid-game puzzle involving knocking out and stealing some tools from one of the guys working on the pipe network in Mercuria. After you've got his tools, the barkeep reminds you to return them before the guy wakes up or the theft will be reported and the Azadi guards will no doubt have questions for him. So a clear objective is established and the consequences for not completing said objective are known to me up front. So I went out and got wrapped up in unraveling this little puzzle and by the time I'd done it, I'd completely forgotten about returning the tools. So the barkeep got taken in for questioning and wasn't seen again after that. I was kicking myself, but I also felt like I had no one to blame but myself for that. So I was more than happy to just live with that one. In a way, my complaint about some of these outcomes is a similar complaint to how Moologic puzzles in old school point and click adventures were unintuitive. In both cases you're screaming, how was I supposed to know that would happen? So maybe that's just par for the genre? A final mechanic that I'd like to talk about is Zoe's superpowers. These are only accessible at certain parts of the game, but that's totally fine because they work in exactly the same way as items do. It's another nice little twist on an established mechanic. Zoe can affect time, look into people's minds, conjure and amplify light Alan Wake style, and even do a Jedi Force push. But these are all just keys, exactly the same as any item in your inventory. To make them work, you simply need to figure out the right order and place to apply them and click the right icons. It's exactly the same as any other inventory puzzle, but with the names and icons changed. This is a very good way of giving a character new abilities without needing to create new mechanics, and serves to give our girl the kind of power she needs when dealing with the final enemy. And speaking of him... Well, I guess it's spoiler time. So welcome to the spoiler section. If the big warning before the start of this chapter didn't chase you away, then let me say one more time that I am about to talk spoilers for this game and the entire saga. Okay? Okay. Let's go. So our third and maybe most important playable character is this little girl, Saga. Our time with her is brief, but she is a character of significant importance later in the game. So. If any of you play tabletop role-playing games, you may have had an incident with certain games masters where, out of the blue, an incredibly cool and very clued up self-insert character turns up to deus ex machina the players out of trouble. I use this particular analogy because I was once upon a time that GM, and no, my players weren't impressed that I stole their moment of glory like that. Okay, it's not all that bad. We, the players at least, have time to get to know Saga and figure out who she really is. And maybe make sense of this particular statement from Ragnar. The girl who saved the world, and who saved April Ryan. I mean, that can't be right, right? April died. Zoe failed. Well... April doesn't seem to think so. I didn't save anyone. You did. How? I was trapped. You freed me. To be honest, this isn't much of a twist. The implications here are pretty heavy-handed. From a shift opening up as we hear Saga's birth cries, to the white dragon approaching her as a baby and addressing her as a sister. Which is what she also calls April. So yes, Saga is April Ryan reborn. Not a shifter, but a traveler through worlds along many paths that connect them in both time and space. Now, I'll show my hand here and say, I'd absolutely love to play a game about Saga, and get a better understanding of who she is, and how she came to be this kind of errand girl for fate, popping into other people's stories, offering a little deus ex machina, and then sauntering off like she's Doctor Who, all because... Because that's how the story goes, and it's been written, and we can't change that. Now shush. Now, where have I heard that before? Because that's how the story goes, April. You escape. 
You outrun your pursuers, and your journey continues. It's been written, and we cannot change that now. From a gameplay standpoint, Saga's story takes place in a few intermissions between chapters, where we see her growing up and confined to the house of all worlds by her father Magnus. Magnus isn't a bad guy, but he lost his wife when Saga was very young and was left to bring her up by himself. He clearly isn't fully aware of how what he's doing is damaging his daughter, and simply doesn't know any other way to keep her safe while he waits on the faint hope that his wife will one day come home. So we're confined to a few small rooms and given some puzzles to fulfill within a very limited space. I'm actually a big fan of this minimalist level design. I've half a mind to make a video on the train level of Resident Evil Zero, as it's a real masterclass in extracting maximum gameplay under strict restrictions. These puzzles aren't all that tough though. Mostly it's just find a bunch of key items and place them somewhere. We do get to hear Saga's internal monologue on the house and her life as we progress though. This leads to the final puzzle when she's in her early teens and breaks down the wards holding her in place to finally go out into the great beyond and find her own story. So Saga turns up right at the end to do April Ryan stuff. Saving Keon's life and opening a shift so that Zoe, Keon and a few others can communicate and coordinate their final attack against the big baddie... Brian Westhouse. Yeah, I know. This guy. So Brian is the prophet. That's a twist I didn't see coming. Oh, who am I kidding? Of course I saw that coming. It was heavily implied that something bad happened to Brian at the start of Dreamfall, and this no doubt contributed to him being an alcoholic in The Longest Journey. And it's a nice twist in the plot, but for two issues. Number one, I don't think I fully get Westhouse's motivation. And number two, this whole part is revealed through a single, massive exposition dump at the end. Zoe basically goes into this special dreamy weemy space where Crow, or what's left of him, yeah, sorry, Crow doesn't make it out alive. I mean, it's complicated. But we basically get this play-by-play -play on events, seeing Brian being possessed by this dark force called the Undreaming, which is basically the antithesis of the Dreaming. But things start to get a little muddy here. It seems that Brian was actually searching for this power to begin with. I don't know why. I mean, filling us in on that might have been a really interesting point of characterization for him. Actually, when we read his journal, he does mention that he's at a crossroads, but there's only one way forward for him. So, maybe he's driven by something that happened to him in the Great War or something like that. It's never explained, which is a real shame. Anyway, once he had it, he was at first overwhelmed by it, which led to his drinking. Perhaps he'd realized he'd bitten off more than he could chew, or perhaps the undreaming dug much deeper into him than he realized, but... He settled on the idea that the only way to rid himself of the Undreaming and return to Stark was to merge the realms of Stark and Arcadia. But before he could do that, he'd need to destroy magic in order to prevent... well, this. So begins his big convoluted plot involving genocide and the construction of a massive calculating machine in Arcadia, and influencing Zoe's parents to engineer dreamers in Stark for experiments to create the Dream Machine. The most notable candidates, of course, being Faith and our girl Zoe. It's needlessly complicated and diabolical, and very fitting of any fantasy sci-fi evil wizard mad scientist final boss. I mean, he could have just taken April up on her offer all the way back in The Longest Journey and hopped through this shift back to Stark. Sure, I don't know what would have happened to the Undreaming, but it might have been easier to go tell his dragon friend about his problems. Yes. This guy is a dragon, and refers to Brian as an old friend. And maybe have them figure out how to deal with the Undreaming. They did orchestrate dividing a world in two after all. I'm sure they've got this. But plot holes big enough to fly a dragon through are par for the course for any fantasy villain's plan. So I don't have any issues with the absurdity of this story, only the method of its reveal. It would have been much better to drip feed the facts throughout the game, and maybe even hide some of it or leave it simply implied, rather than just dump it on us all like that. It leads to a cool last stand in an awesome magical tower and super science lab, throws in some twists and turns that I haven't spoiled, and ultimately ends in a very satisfying way, with the dreamer and the undreaming realizing that they are simply two parts of one whole, and that they must exist in balance versus trying to devour each other.
which, as you may have noticed, has been a big theme through this entire series. Which brings us to the very end. So a lot of threads get tied up, Zoe moves back to Casablanca with her father, and we find her heavily pregnant at the end of the game. Kian and Saga go off adventuring in Azadia with a view to end the tyranny of the church and restore... well, balance, I guess. Saga being very clued up on how stories go, informs Kian that he'd do well to adopt her so that she can use the power of his name around the city, turning her into... Lady Alvane. Which is where our story closes. Many years have passed, and our young and exotic heroine has grown into a tired old lady who has found her peace back in the house where she grew up and was once confined. I love this comfy chair line. It's the comfy chair. <laughs> she sometimes entertains guests and shares stories with them, and even has a longtime friend in. Well, if April can be reborn, then I've no doubt the most magical of all magical birds has got that covered too. But alas for poor Crow, he must depart, for Lady Alvane is expecting one final guest. Credits roll, and we are treated to some spectacular artwork depicting the major events of our entire story. While the music and the whole atmosphere stirs what might be tears up from somewhere in the depths of our very souls. The Longest Journey is three incredible stories, told through three flawed but overall beautiful games made by passionate creators who did everything in their power to pour love and devotion into them, and infuse them with a soul. While each entry has its problems, I can honestly say I'm really happy I went through it all, and I'd be really happy to do it all again someday. Ragnar has expressed a desire to make a game about Saga one day, but Red Thread Games are working on new stories in new worlds, and their most recent project, Dustborn, looks like it's going to be quite the banger. I'll definitely check it out, and if I like it, you'll have to hear all about it I'm afraid. We leave Zoe in Stark now. Production of the Dream Machine has been shut down, and she no longer poses any threat to the powerful syndicate that still throttles the world. She is safe and home, and very pregnant. Likewise, we leave Kian and Saga on a balcony in Azadir, looking out over the city five years after their arrival there. Are they conquerors? Victors? Survivors? Whatever. These images mean they stand strong and proud, saviors of the world divided, and ready to take the next step in the longest journey. Well guys, what a ride it's been. Thank you for coming along with me through all of this. I started playing The Longest Journey in late July, before I went back to the UK for a month, and before I'd even edited my Shadow of Destiny video. So this has been quite the long journey, and I'm kinda glad it's over. I think I'll steer clear of doing a series of games again for a while, but I'm not done with games with a soul. Not by a long shot. In fact, I might make that something of a channel slogan. So now it's time to head away from fantastical magic worlds and cyberpunk dystopias, and head to somewhere simpler to deal with something a lot smaller and infinitely deeper than anything we've explored so far. Next time we will visit the country of Revachal, and meet a man who could have one of many names and identities, as he tries to solve a murder, but more importantly, as he tackles the greatest mystery of the universe. The one question to rule them all. Who. Am. I. This all sounds very disco baby. Hello to you late stayers. 
I see you lurking in the back seat wondering if there's a whole surprise video hidden somewhere around here. Well, sorry to disappoint. We are approaching the end of the year, and I've probably got two more stories to share before we tick over into 2023. Unless I get an idea for something short and fun to cover before then. For now though, I'll just say thanks to all of you who keep coming back and commenting. I really appreciate it. If you did play along with my little challenge to search for early 2000s adventure games, let me know in the comments which game you saw that really played on your nostalgia. And to the other creators who I have semi-regular banter with on the Twitter space, thanks guys. You know who you are. Oh yeah, I'm on there if you'd like to follow me. Don't forget to do all the stuff for the channel, but for now, Arkham Rides. Yeah.